Welcome to Alienating the Audience. Other podcasts ice skate on top of science fiction. We're breaking through the ice and scuba diving underneath. And today we're going to go very, very deep into sci-fi indeed. We're going to explore simulation theory, which is the central conceit in The Matrix, as well as a ton of books and TV shows ranging from Philip K. Dick to Black Mirror to Rick and Morty. Now, rather than doing a play-by-play, of any of these specific works of science fiction, we're going to analyze and explore the underlying idea itself. Are we living in a computer simulation? What's the nature of consciousness? And could it even exist in a computer-generated simulation? Once we've established the ins and outs of a truly fascinating theory about the nature of existence, we'll look at how its various scenarios have been applied throughout science fiction. We'll even rope in Douglas Adams and C.S. Lewis at one point. And finally, we'll ask... If we're living in a computer simulation, is there any way we could prove it? And after the interview, my comedian friend Nick Spurduti and I will tell you about our recent trip performing on Skull Island, the home of King Kong. Dust off your USB port because we're about to jack in. My guest today is Mr. Jay Munsafi, uh, and he is the host of two podcasts. He hosts the Lucid Dreaming podcast, and he also hosts the Last Turtle podcast. Lucid Dreaming podcast, I'm pretty sure I know what that is. Yeah. The Last Turtle podcast is probably more what we're going to be doing today. It's sort of citizen philosophy, which is how you and I know each other. Uh, I'm, I'm presently in, in Portland, Oregon, and went on meetup.com and was intrigued by this one, uh, one event that was, uh, are we living in a simulation? And I went, well, I'd sure like to know if we're living in a simulation or not, because that will inform me on whether or not it's ethical for me to rob liquor stores. And uh, maybe I'll meet some cool people. Anyway, I enjoyed the presentation that you did. Thank you. And then about three, and I went just to check it out, right? But about three quarters of the way through, I went, oh, wait a minute. This guy's probably a sci-fi dork. I bet uh, I I could totally grab him and and bring him on the show to talk about simulation theory, which is what we're going to talk about today. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I think you've nailed it about the sci-fi dorkiness. Nice. So, so, okay, simulation theory, and this is all over science fiction, but in in terms of the actual theory itself, what is simulation theory? It's the idea that there is a high likelihood that we are actually living in a simulation. And that sort of comes from the idea that One, we are increasingly building more sophisticated and realistic simulation, computer simulations. Um, And the fact that our perception is such that it can be, um, you know, tricked and manipulated in such a way as to confuse us about the nature of what we're experiencing. So the most common current example of this is virtual reality. You can put in goggles and while you know that it's just a fake reality at the moment, it is becoming increasingly more realistic and you it's easy for you to forget yourself in there and kind of feel like you are in the environment. In fact, if something flies at you, you duck, yeah. even though you know there's nothing coming at you, really. And people fall all the time and, and so on and so forth. I, I had a, a cool experience about three years ago now. I was in Las Vegas. Uh, on an unrelated note, I was opening for William Shatner in an event, uh, but it was at this kind of um, conference environment and... Uh, there was a virtual reality booth, and I hadn't done virtual reality in any capacity since maybe 1998. Uh, and in 1998, VR was like you could kind of box like a pixelated guy, and well, it really wasn't very impressive. And I, I put on this headset, and it, within this virtual reality world, immediately went up to like the 40th floor of a building, and the and they uh, they had like a wooden plank I could walk on, and they went, okay, you're going to walk off this plank. Oh yeah, and neofrontal cortex me knows that I am at a <laughs> conference center in Las Vegas. Uh, amygdala me has, there's no way to communicate with your amygdala. Your amygdala is going, what are you doing? And I stepped off the board and then did like a barrel roll, which I don't <laughs> think would actually have saved my life if I fell off a 40 story building. I don't know. I, I guess it's just instinctive, but now it's getting better and better. And then uh, a, a few years before that, uh, when I was living in Washington, I came into my apartment and I went, oh, are you guys watching a war movie? And my roommates were, no, they were just playing a video game. Oh, and yeah. I was blown away by how good the graphics were. And it's only going to get better. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I, I showed at the at the meetup is like this presentation about um, it's a it's a demo of a 
graphics engine that is rendering graphics in real time that looks as realistic as any video of like nature yeah right it was trees oh and, it's crazy and flowers yeah. and it's unbelievable and what's amazing about it it's it's not like it's you know big computers rendering for 30 hours to produce a 10 second scene for a marvel movie this is like real-time rendering granted with a very powerful computer uh, but that just looks as real as anything else now what what happens is like people- when, when you say real time rendering, you mean that it's being made up on the spot. Yes. Uh, like 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 there's somebody put in activate forest and the computer went, OK, here's a forest. Yeah, there is the program for the forest, you know, ahead of time. But it's actually rendering the pixels, the visual component of it in real time. It doesn't have to wait and then just show you a static video. It's actually sort of playing it such that if you change the the camera it will show you the rest of the thing around it it's it's creating a virtual environment mm -hmm. that it still looks realistic but is rendered in real time yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and and as you point out only getting better and better right uh, and the better and better that gets it raises the question of hey wait a minute are we in a video game or are we in the real world uh where's the how likely is it that we are living in the actual universe and getting better and better at making videos versus we are in somebody else's experiment of some kind. And the better the technology gets, the more likely it is that we're living in that experiment. Yeah, and, there, and there's a reason why people make that leap because it is still a very big leap. Like the, the real world is it's very, it's very realistic. <laughs> it just so happens. Um, but it is still very different than what we've produced so far. Uh, and there's reason to say why, like, okay, but I know this this feels real with all my senses and everything else. But if you extrapolate the technology forward, if you think ahead into the future and say, um, there's no reason to believe why we why we will stop the progression of the technology that we can that we can make, and barring that we go extinct or get bored by technology, we will continually make better and better simulations such that in the future, they can make simulations of very complex worlds, including the, an entire you know, Earth, perhaps, with all its people. Um, so if you think about the simulations we make for games right now, like The Sims or Second Life, so we're already creating full environments, even World of Warcraft, right? There's a whole world that people run around in with characters, full characters, and you can increasingly make more and more complex simulations like this up to the point that in the future, again, there isn't anything inherent about technology that would prevent us from creating a simulation that encompasses a full-fledged world, or at least from the point of view of a particular person, everything around them could be um, you know, rendered in, in, in realistic. Now, it's gonna get easier and cheaper technology-wise to create more and more simulations. So in the future, maybe an historian would wanna create a simulation of the past, let's say, you know, 5,000 years from now, they want to say, oh, what happened in the 20th, 21st century when this and that happened? Or what would have happened if we changed some parameters? Let's create a full world with full, all the people and run that simulation and see what unfolds. And um, that's where people get like, okay, they will create thousands, if not millions of simulations that are undistinguishable from reality if we can create um, conscious machines, if we are simulating a full brain of a person, in, the in theory, um, how do we know that this currently now is not some simulation that is running in the future? Right. We're, we're not, how do we know we're not the NPCs on World of Warcraft uh, or, or some equivalent of that? <laughs> exactly. And uh, I don't know. Well, uh, one of the things that uh, you brought up in the presentation was um, Bostrom's theorem, uh, or, or, or the argument, the yeah, simulation and, argument. And, yeah, walk us through that because he he kind of has like a like a probability type of thing where he goes is basically one of three scenarios, and, and we can we can look at the possibility that we're in a, a simulation through that lens. Yeah, he basically proposes uh, the idea that one of three possibilities must be true. One either um, future civilizations mature, he calls it technologically mature civilizations, um, like Sweden. Yeah, basically. <laughs> either either they will go extinct, right? So um, I gave the example of the, the Fermi paradox, right? We, we wonder why there are no... Right. We, we see no uh, signs of intelligent life. Maybe civilizations um, get to a point in technology where they always destroy themselves. And so it's very hard to get beyond a certain point. 
and f- future civilizations won't be get be- beyond a point where they can do something like this. So either we go extinct at some point in the future, or so that's possibility number one. And, and I'll, I'll add to that 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 would also explain or, or that would reinforce the idea of computational processing going back to um, uh, rendering going on, right? So uh, assuming that you, if we were living in a simulation and um, the, the world in which the simulation is being processed has finite resources, which is a reasonable inference to make, right? right. Then it may not, it, it might only um, be rendering reality insofar as a, cogn- a conscious individual's looking at something, right? So it's not bothering to create alien worlds because we're not over there. So if we're living in, in, <laughs> right. a, in a simulation, we are the only beings in the simulation because it's not going to bother dedicating power to creating the planet Vulcan or whatever elsewhere, which would uh, which would add some reinforcement to the Fermi paradox. Yeah, that's actually one of the uh, one of the arguments people use in favor of the simulation hypothesis because they say, well. You know, it seems like it's just us. Like the universe seems to be wide and, and far from here, and you know, whatever we're seeing it could be just rendered. But if we're not seeing anybody else, and it's just us, that seems to lend itself far more to an idea of like, let's simulate this planet with just these people and see what happens. We don't need to bother with, you know, thousands or millions of other civilizations, very, 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 very far. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the in the other sidebar that is worth mentioning, and like you said is that when people think like, oh, it would just take just an inconceivable amount of computation to even just render the earth, right? And all and all the people, uh, there's two answers for that. One, you might not have to, right? So just like a video game, sometimes you see when the rendering is kind of slow or there's a lag, you're running around the environment, you see everything in front of you. And as you turn, you see that it's hasn't, it, it, the, behind you was not actually being rendered because there's no point. You can't see it yeah. and there's no reason to make those computations. But as soon as you turn around, that environment suddenly shows up and the one that's now behind you disappears because there's no need to render all of that all of the time. And there's, there's also, I think, a, a built-in presumption in that, uh, that criticism of simulation theory that all six billion people on planet Earth are actual conscious individuals that are, are having that information funneled into, which is a very kind way of looking at things. But what if the simulation only has 30 people in it? And so it's you and some of your immediate friends and everybody else isn't. Uh, or, or, or just one. Or, or just, just one. Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. In that case, eh, maybe we could make that simulation work. Yeah, but solipsism is a, is a tricky idea. Like if that, you are the only conscious creature in, in existence, everybody else is just a figment of your reality, so to speak, but not actual conscious creatures on their own. Uh, we don't have reasons to believe that other than that it's a possibility because you can't know another person's consciousness. But we'll get that. We'll yeah. Get, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get that I should let you get finish the, the no, no. Like, Bostrom's theorem. Sorry. It's, there, this is a topic so tangent filled that it's just yeah. it's impossible to talk about it without getting into all of these nuances, which are just as fun as we, yeah, we, we've done a good job of avoiding the like 15 different sci-fi examples <laughs> but we will we'll get into them in a minute but it's oh, very absolutely. easy to, to, to go on these forks but yeah continue with Bostrom's theorem yeah so, so let, let's review because we have got on these tangents here so Bostrom begins with the, the premise that um it, it civilization or there, there's one of three scenarios right so scenario one is civilizations become technologically advanced enough that they could create a simulation of their ancestors, right? He, so, he sort of goes in reverse. He says one of the, the following three possibilities must be true. Either civilizations that are technologically advanced enough to do something like this would go extinct. Okay. If they don't go extinct, second, second possibility, they might lose interest in creating what he calls ancestor simulations, right? Okay. So in the future, they'll create simulations of the past of their ancestors. Um, if they don't lose interest in creating these simulations for whatever reason, because it's hard to predict what future civilizations would actually want right. and care for, if they don't lose interest, then it is more most likely that we are living in a simulation. So he gives it less than 50% chance that that is true. That is the simulation argument. If you, if you take the first two points and say, yes, I don't think that those are gonna be correct, then he po- he proposes that the last one should be correct. And the reason he says that, again, is a combination of a few things. One is he believes that we could simulate um, whole brains, and, and, in, and because of that, that would mean that we're simulating uh, conscious, conscious creatures. Um, and he has actually run these, these calculations, which are, you know, a bit loose, but he has taken the idea of like, okay, what would it take to simulate an entire brain 
um, or, or computations for one second for a brain with X amount of neurons and then double that for the entire life of the person and then multiply that by everybody who ever lived, which is, I don't know, 100 billion people, and you get to something like 10 to the power of 34 to 37, which... Which is a crazy big number. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not a math person, but I know whenever you see exponents, it means it's a big number. It is inconceivably large, um, but... Dozens of powers of magnitude. Dozens. dozens of them, yeah. <laughs> uh, we should start counting. I think it's, you know, just to see if his math is right. But um, the idea is that this is not an an impossible uh, amount of computations to run if you have in the future enough computing power, which would take, according to him, I believe, something like a planet-sized computer. Okay. Which, again, there are many, not only sci-fi authors, right. um, but also scientists who think about things like Dyson spheres yeah. and, you know, I don't see why in the future we won't be able to create gigantic like planet size and, and then i'm computers. also thinking on top of that that you wouldn't really have to worry about the processing speed because from our perspective like let, let's say the computer's slowing up and and um, sto uh, slowing up or speeding up depending on what what they want to allocate resources to because also our, our alien masters are playing minesweeper or yeah. something right we would never know because we're uh, the the processing speed would not affect our subjective reality or our subjective experience. So if, if they were going to have a simulation run of you know, 2019, 2020, um, but they were going to slowly crunch the numbers over a thousand years, we would have no idea. Right. Pres right. Presumably any, any technology that's big enough to process this would also be fast enough to handle it. But, um, but I'm just saying that our subjective time experience would not necessarily be built into the actual processing speed of the computer. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And that really gets into you know, subjective experience, and it's a tricky subject because, one, we don't fully understand how the brain works, um, and um, we also don't fully understand how consciousness and the brain are related, um, and and we'll, we'll get to that as well. But the, the ultimate point is that, you know, we, again, when I say think into the future, in the far future we'll be able to do X, Y, or Z, people, it's hard for people to imagine but if you just say, we are not going to go extinct, we're just going to continue, continue, continue in a thousand years, 5,000 years, forget like 5,000, how about 5 million years? Like, again, barring some extinction, we will just keep going and there is kind of no about end the, in the sight. the mind sweeper 5 million years from now. It's going to be <laughs> one hell of a game. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, somebody should start on it now because yeah. it's going to take a while to develop. But if you uh, think about, there's a, a physicist not, named David Deutsch. Um, uh, I think he's a theoretical physicist who wrote a book, The Beginning of Infinity. And his thesis, in some sense, is that um, with, with the right knowledge and barring the restrictions of the laws of physics, anything within that parameter is possible, right? So... Given enough the, 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 the right knowledge, we can create anything you can imagine that as long as it, it's within the, the parameters of the laws of physics. And that gives you a crazy amount of Right, be, 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 because we're, we're predicating this on having a near infinite amount of time. So you've, you've got the time from now until the universe goes into heat death yeah. or whatever, which infinite is... Infinite amount of time, nearly infinite amount of energy and materials. And it's just contingent on us not blowing ourselves up. Exactly. As long as that happens or an asteroid doesn't hit. <laughs> <laughs> we would eventually do that. I, th yeah, I, I follow that logic that, that eventually we would we would be able to go through those. And and I'll say like the amount of uh, technology available today would, would is um, uh, fairly promising in that regard that we could do that. I mean, we, you brought yeah. up VR at the beginning of this. Um, I could foresee a scenario within my lifetime where if, if somebody is um, severely injured or something that they are you know put into a virtual reality scenario. Um, or conversely, like I, it wouldn't surprise me at all if by the time I have kids, they're going on field trips in a virtual reality scenario to go see what Genghis Khan was like uh, yeah. or something like that. And then it, it's not a huge jump to go from that to maybe we're plugged into it. Right. And people say, oh, well, you're wearing goggles, you still feel it, and there's no like yet like full immersion body suits or any kind. Like It will be hard to completely fool you to a large degree. But what we also forget, and the, my, one of my favorite examples, again, we're talking about like the lucid dreaming stuff, um, is, is dreaming. Um, everybody who has dreamt even at least once knows that the brain can produce an experience of reality that you can't distinguish from the real reality unless you either wake up or become lucid or aware of the fact that you're dreaming. And it is 
remarkable the ability of your brain to create a full um, scenery and sense immersion kind of experience um, and trick you to believing that that is completely real. So once we have, once we understand the brain better, we can skip the goggles and everything else and send input directly Just to jack the, brain. the thing into the back of your skull and well, <laughs> plug you into the matrix or whatever it is. Well, have you seen like uh, Elon Musk's Neuralink presentation? No. Uh, so he started a company to create a brain computer interface that is like this mesh network embedded into your skull, right? And it, it kind of sits in. Um, it is like a higher resolution than everything we've done before. We've done some directly Wait, hold on. to can the you, brain. Can you back up? He's, he's doing my machine interface technology? Oh, yes. And like, where is it at? Do you know? Um, the, uh, the presentation that they gave, the public presentation that they gave, is fairly impressive in terms of the amount of electrodes. Let's see if I'm getting this right. The amount of electrodes that can be inserted into the brain using um, a basically a, a, a robot neurosurgeon of sorts. Um, and in targeting specific areas of the of the brain, and being able to uh, at least pick up from the brain um, certain impulses, right, and then give to the brain certain impulses. So the idea is, uh, I mean, the, their main focus right now is to be able to uh, help people who are uh, paralyzed, who maybe who can't see. Like there are all sorts of mm -hmm. ways to interact directly with the brain and circumvent problems. Right, and in part part of his maybe you're quadriplegic and you want to have like an exosuit or something that allows you to, to walk around and function normally. Right, or or, or, or if you can't talk, and you've got you a stroke can, or something. Or, you yeah. can use a computer to like think the words that you want to say, and the computer will speak for you because you are now connected. So or, or I can see like uh, if you were um, if you have early onset Alzheimer's or, exactly. or you have dementia or something, there could be this weird thing where you actually have Alzheimer's and permanently have Alzheimer's, but you're able to store your memories on a a hardware um, that's external from you and boot it up whenever you need it exactly. so that you're basically able to walk around it. Yeah. And uh, this is another tangent, but it's worth mentioning that one of his proclaimed reasons for working on this as well is as one of the solutions to the problems, potential problems with AI. Right. right? You can't so, beat them, become them. We'll, be, we'll all become with cyborgs. The machines. Yep. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So you, there's there's no one to fight if you're, if you're one and the same, really. Right? Well, and, and to, so to back away from the um, mind machine interface perspective. Um, we've also recently made, I don't know what you call it, artificial synapses or, or a, a simulation of an organism, right? With nematodes where, yeah. um, so like, like a human, a human brain has, I don't know how many neural synapses, probably more than 40, yeah. uh, a lot, right? Or I, I think technically Give or like, take. there's, there's more neural synapses in the human brain than there are stars in the galaxy or something like that, or con con connections between the synapses. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's like a crazy amount, right? Yeah. So difficult to simulate a human brain. We can't do that. However, um, it, it might've been Bostrom or somebody, I don't know, um, basically designed a computer program that could account for all of uh, the neural synapses in a nematode, which is like a tiny tapeworm or something like that. Yeah, I'm not really yeah, sure. yeah. It's a it's a tiny worm. It's one of the most sort of basic creatures we found where we can count the number of. Uh, right. There's uh, 302. I don't know if that's like always this accurate with every. Uh, the really nematode. smart nematodes have 303. Uh, yeah. The kind of dull ones have 301, and the average one, the you know the bell curve <laughs> nematode has 302. <laughs> exactly, and so um, we've mapped out the brain of this. You know small and adorable creature and we've created a we the proverbial we have created no, a i'll take credit for it yeah. good job mankind we yeah. did it guys oh, way to go uh and so um we've created a simulation a, a model full representation of all the synapses all the all the neurons in their interactions in a computer right and so that is sort of the first step towards being able to model more complex brains more complex brain interactions and hopefully one day a full human brain and more. Gotcha. Okay, so we have a we have the the mental map or, or the brain map of a nematode. We don't have a nematode living on a Tamagotchi machine. Like we have we haven't made sentient Tamagotchis yet. Well, definitely not sentient Tamagotchis, but uh, we we have a simulation of a nematode interacting with a virtual world, right? Okay. It doesn't necessarily, as far as I know, they haven't rendered the visual aspect of it running around, but like, you know, uh, numerical representation of it moving, getting 
uh, rudimentary inputs and outputs, basically, like it re it's reacting to its environment, right? So they, they poke it virtually, and I think it, you know, they, they want to see what happens in, in its virtual brain and how it reacts, what it recoils from, what it gets attracted to from scent or something like that. I'm, I'm not sure of all the exact details. But yes, the idea in part was to model its behavior um, based on its, you know, brain. Okay, so then the next question that this immediately begs, and I hadn't planned on going off on this tangent, but it's worthwhile doing now, oh, yeah. is if this is if this is a series of ones and zeros on a computer that they've mapped out, um, is the nematode in any way conscious? And I will uh, I will preface this with I'm going to say I'm going to define conscious as just being some kind of being experiencing something, right? So I, for my, I'm making a distinction here between sapience, which is what you and I are, and what people listening to the show are, uh, but, but not your, your pet you know, turtle. Um, sapient is being able to think and consciously, and, and you know, some threshold of intelligence is the definition of sapience, I think. Conscious, we're just talking about a living, be a living being that experiences something. So with that nematode simulation uh, be is it just a series of ones and zeros that's, that are doing things in a replicated environment? Or would we call that conscious? So I don't think that would be conscious. And there are people who disagree with me <laughs> vehemently, but I, I believe that that is fundamentally different. And there is some mystery about consciousness um, that is as coined as like the hard problem of consciousness, you know, which differentiated from the so-called so to speak, easy problem of consciousness of just for finding neural correlates of consciousness. Like if you're experiencing this, what is happening in the brain at the same time and the correlations between ex specific subjective experience and the, and, and the type of experience that in the brain, like what is happening in which neurons and which areas and, and what firing rate and so on and so forth. Um, the hard problem of consciousness is basically the idea of why would at all any form of physical matter end up resulting in a subjective first-person experience. Why are the lights on at all, right? And we know there is a difference between being conscious and not being conscious, and most of us don't believe that our tables and chairs and you know rocks are conscious. We might believe that a, a chimp is conscious and maybe a fish, and there's a good question of how far down that might, right. that might go. We have plenty of reasons to believe that a lot of creatures are experiencing something. Um, and so a model in a computer, again, I believe, would not become conscious just because you have mathematically represented every aspect of it. I think it's like a map, it's a language, it's a way of talking about something. Right. So when we're uh, modeling a hurricane to be able to predict what it will do, that is just a representation of something that happens in the real world, but there is no wetness or wind in the computer. So, so it, needs, it needs to have something in your view, and I think I, I've not thought about this nearly as deeply, but I think I share your perspective, um, is that it is not merely information. There has to be some sort of hardware interaction going on for something to be conscious. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say because we don't really understand it, and that's where it gets a little tricky. Um, but I believe, again, it, it's, it's, it's important to distinguish between saying um, we you know, we don't know, so anything could be the reality, and saying there, there's what we know and there's what we don't know, and there is a weird gap in particular in, in between. Um, but No, I follow, because that, that makes sense to me in that if it's only information, I mean, ultimately all computers are, they're basically a series of switches, aren't they? Isn't that what a computer is? It's basically ones and zeros. And transistors, it's, yeah. If, yeah, it's transistors, and you know, like it, they're, they're basically electric, electric abaci, abacus, abacus, abacusy. I don't know how, I don't know what the plural is. I'm not really undermining my argument here. But, uh, or to put it another way, um, I like a, a thought experiment. I, I read a book over the summer called The Three Body Program. I'm sorry, The, the Three Body Problem, um, which is um, the, the breakout science fiction novel of China in 2018. I might do it later in the podcast. Uh, and there's, there's a moment in the, in the book where the civilization is trying to process um, really big computational problems, but they're, if the, they're, they're effectively at the Napoleonic level of technology. They don't have computers yet, but they're needing to do all of these equations. And so they get millions of people with flags to do semaphore, right? Yeah. Which is a computer. It's the, it's the same thing as a computer, right? And then and then, but but I would go okay. Well, 
it doesn't matter how, how many millions of people you have holding flags up in a particular order, at no point do those flags result in consciousness, from my perspective, right? Right. But you could have the information that would simulate it or map it or whatever. Right. Um, and it seems to me that if it's if it's just information on a computer, that may that wouldn't work. There needs to be some kind of some combination of hormones or chemicals or or biology or something or or alternately some kind of spiritual matrix where there's a Cartesian duality uh, that that you know puncture, uh, punctures down from the 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 ether into into our bucket of organs or something. Yeah, it's easy to fall into dualism, which I'm I'm definitely not a dualist. Um, but I, I, I do believe that there is something unique. Maybe it's just a matter of the way it's com- uh, the composition of, of matter, perhaps. Or maybe it is the type of matter, right? Maybe um, there is something about the neurochemical reactions or the electricity in particular through neurons. Um, I, I, I don't think there's a reason to believe why it's specifically... Uh, biological matter that can only become conscious. We don't. We don't really, again, fully understand it. Um, but but there is a theory of consciousness uh, called information. Um, ITP. IT, I forget the exact uh, acronym. But it, that it that basically puts at the center of it uh, information processing. Right. Com- as soon as you get complex enough information processing, that will produce some conscious experience. And there are really smart people who are you know, really good at what they do and very, very serious about it that are trying to actually uh, create a mathematical model of this. I still think there is something missing from that because you can have a lot of complexity and a lot of information processing in, again, already current computers, but we don't believe that that system necessarily is conscious. And we can't even, even once you say, okay, maybe it's complex information processing, what is it about the sufficient complexity that suddenly becomes mm. conscious? There is always a leap to subjective experience that you can't account for just by talking about matter. Right. Now, people trying to solve that a problem with something like dualism or panpsychism, right? Believing that perhaps consciousness is uh, fundamental to reality and to matter, that there is in every little atom and electron and proton and so on, some rudimentary fundamental uh, amount of whatever this thing that consciousness and that, that, is. That would be the idea that the the physical universe that we're experiencing right now is almost more like an interface on a computer monitor that's emblematic of reality and, and how we um, how we interact with it rather than the reality itself. And that the reality of your computer is ones and zeros, but we it's easier for us to use it as a mouse cursor and that kind of thing, right? And so the panpsychism would be more like that, where consciousness predates the physical universe. Well, that actually, that could map onto one another. I think the uh, the idea of the computer interface, uh, Donald Hoffman actually uh, put it beautifully, really um, illustrating that and in, in, in championing the idea that we're not seeing reality as it actually is. Mm-hmm. Um, but But how we're seeing to begin with, right? Um, the fact that we're conscious of anything, whether it's accurate or not accurate, could be could have multiple different explanations. And in particular, panpsychism would just say that it's not like the brain, um, that the consciousness is a uh, epiphenomena. It's not that it's just an emergent phenomena of the brain itself. And without a brain, there just will be no you know consciousness. And without enough information processing, it doesn't just show up. But rather. It is like gravity. I like to, to give the example of gravity as a way to illustrate this. Um, even the smallest particles, most small particles have a very a small amount of, of gravity, so, so small that it's, it's called the weak force. Um, but if you put enough of it together, it's so influential that it can you know, move um, stars and, 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 and planets around. And so I am sort of seeing or I'm wondering if there is something about particular combinations and organization of matter and information processing with it that suddenly accumulates enough of this, you know, consciousness and produces what we experience as subjective experience. Does that make sense? It is. And I am so glad I had three cups of coffee before I started talking to you. <laughs> this is the most I've had to think in about four months. It's great. It's great. Well, so I'll deviate slightly for a minute because I'm glad we got into what consciousness is and that's worth returning to and maybe doing another podcast on. But um, sticking to the simulation, we first of all, we've done a great job. We've actually gone 35 minutes with without getting into sci-fi. <laughs> so this is, the, this is the longest prelude to a sci-fi podcast uh, imaginable. But I want to go through... 
um, some of the examples of science fiction so that we can use them, uh, examples of simulation theory in science fiction, to yeah. kind of map out the scenarios that might happen. Um, so I'll, I'll begin with, um, or I'll, I'll ask you, um, the first time you were aware of simulation theory in some capacity, for me, um, The Matrix was the first time this had ever occurred to me. I think anybody born in the 80s probably had that same thing. Um, anybody born in the 90s, or, or this is terrifying to me, anybody born in the 2000s listening to the podcast, I think, I think that simulation theory has been baked in enough to our culture now that that's not mind-blowing. Uh, but like me growing right. up, um, the Truman Show, which isn't exactly simulation theory, but is kind of adjacent to it, uh, and uh, The Matrix, um, they were both mind-blowing. And, and I, I walked out of The Matrix. Um, I would have been in middle school. It was actually a Boy Scout camp out, got canceled for some reason, so we went to go see The Matrix instead. And then we camped in Will's Lawn. Very, very strange thing. But, but you, you walked out of the theater and were like, oh, my God. And like you're just looking at the parking lot going, is this real? Is this all fake? I don't know. What was your first experience? Yeah, I was blown away as well, not just because of the cinematic marvel that was the movie itself, but the idea of, like, you could actually, in theory, you know, fool somebody completely in, in, in terms of what they believe is real. And it shakes your, yeah. you know, feeling of reality. Now, I, it just so happened that I've had experiences as a kid with lucid dreaming that really kind of illustrates that as well because the unique thing about waking up from a dream, not just into your bed and going like, oh, wow, that's, that's really weird. How did I fall for that again? Uh, because we're used to it from, from childhood, we, we don't give it a second thought. It's right. kind of like, okay, yeah, of course, it's yeah, yeah. just dreaming. Um, but if you're actually in a dream and you wake up in the dream to the realization that it's just a dream, but the dream still continues, you're just looking around, you're looking at your hands, you're looking at the environment, and suddenly you know uh, for a fact that this is not real. You you can see through the illusion just as like metadata in your head. You just know it, right? Yeah. But nothing visually has changed. And yet now you can actually explore the environment and you're like, I am in the most realistic, high resolution, full body suit VR that's been ever invented. And it is marvelous. And I, I have mind control. I can change the environment just by thinking. And I wake up every time. This happens to me about once a year. I realize that I'm, there's a slight possibility that I am dreaming. I am having a lucid dream and don't realize it. But I think I'm lucid dreaming, right? So I'll wake up once a year inside the dream. Every time I go, Awesome! I'm gonna fly and yep. have sex with somebody. Yep. And the second I think that, I wake up because I'm so excited. And now I'm awake and angry and horny. And there's probably a German word for that. I don't know what it is. It's very difficult to back to sleep. It's actually not a pleasant experience at all. But if I could ever train my brain to do it. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so, so it sounds like you were already kind of. It was less mind blowing for you when you saw the Matrix right. as a result of this. Right. Because I thought, okay, this is just an internal sort of phenomena that that can happen in our brains, and it's fascinating, it's interesting. But the idea that we could all be living in like a shared simulation orchestrated by some advanced technology was just mind shattering, mm -hmm. right? And you know, to add to that, and just one last piece about the lucid dreaming thing. It really messes with your mind once you have false awakenings where you're in a dream and then you wake up, you get up from the bed, you walk around, and then you wake up again only to realize right. that that wake up was false. You were still dreaming. You dreamt that you were waking up. And if you have two or three of these in a row, you really start questioning your reality. When I was a freshman in college, uh, I had to go take a anthropology uh, test my freshman year, and I took a nap on the couch in the dorm, woke up, Walked to the place to do the test, woke up, back on the couch, went, all right, got up, went to go take this test, woke up again. And like the third time, I was like, fuck it. I'm not doing this. I, I understand what's going on here. I'm not your little play thing. And, like, and my friend said to me, like, you're, you're, nope, you're, you're fine, man. You need to go take this test now. I was like, all right, I'll take it. But, and I'm sitting there going, okay, this seems legit. Uh, but in, in, the, in The Matrix, yeah. then, like, is, is kind of the kickoff scenario for this, because I think a lot of people listening probably experienced The Matrix as the first, you know, mind-blowing, we might be living in a simulation type thing. Um, that one's malicious, right? In that scenario, uh, it is we are being actively used um, for some nefarious purpose where, at best, we are um, morally neutral to the people, uh, the, the beings creating the scenario. Right. Um, I wonder, like, like I think... The, the economist in me, um, which is, by the way, far more versed uh, than, than the, the physicist in me, would go, okay, well, that's an unlikely scenario in that um, 
uh, the, the amount of just the, the sheer amount of resources you would need in order to sustain human beings would almost certainly outpace the, the bioelectric energy being produced by a brain. That's the biggest complaint I've heard about the movie is the battery idea. Yeah, but where, where I could swing back on it, though, uh, have you read um, oh, uh, Hyperion by I think it's Dan Simmons? I've heard of it. Yeah. Um, so a little bit of a spoiler for, for people listening. Um, uh, if, if you're going to read the Hyperion series, skip this next bit. Go 30 seconds ahead. Um, in, in that series, uh, there's a, a like group of hyper-intelligent robot beings, right? Uh, and, and we later find out that they exist by um, running the programs through, through human brains. That basically, as humans are passing through these portals, that transition state that only takes a second or two, they're able to use the brain as a neural network. And because there's millions of human beings going through this transition state at the time, even though the it's like computers are flicking on and off constantly, but there's enough of them that there's this massive organic computer which allows them to exist. And I can see that in the matrix being a scenario where there are human brains that are being used to, to power some sort of processing computer thing. Power. Yeah, processing power. And the, the side effect of that is that we have to be in some kind of matrix-like realm uh, to keep us from going insane or something. Right, and that's, that's very interesting. And in the matrix in particular, what was interesting about that particular variation is that you, if you could plug into the brain, that's the only, that's the only access point you need. Right? Like you can input and output information and get everything you need in order to fool somebody completely. Um, and it, it's interesting that it was just used for energy and not necessarily like, you know, brain computing power mm -hmm. or, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and then like, uh, um, you know, it could be, so with, with, uh, with Bostrom, there's the idea that there would be some sort of ancestral analysis going on. Uh, and I could see that happening. Like you, you brought up history scenarios earlier, right? So like I, I love history and, and I, I've, I've, I love alternate history, both in terms of science fiction or speculative fiction, I suppose, or in terms of actual like historians writing down, you know, what if a storm had, you know, thrown off the Spanish Armada, or I don't know, whatever the thing is, yeah. right? Um, that would make a lot of sense to me if, if we're, we're living, let's say the real world is the year 3,800, 1,800 years have passed since our current time. Uh, and computer processing is cheap and abundant and all this kind of stuff. I could see there being a scenario where University of Oklahoma is like, hey, let's crank the numbers. What would happen if Kennedy only had one term? Crazy thought. But really, what would have happened if he got shot in Texas? And like we're living in that universe. And uh, there's a series of just uh, theoretical history scenarios that we're living out just so somebody can see what would have happened. Yeah, and we're, we're already actually running uh, military scenarios, right? So planning for battle, planning for different situations. There are already simulations trying to figure out what could happen if, um, you know, X, Y, or Z starts occurring, or if you change the parameters, or if you move more troops here. Mm. There are a lot of like increasingly sophisticated scenarios trying to simulate and see what will happen. Yeah. So that will probably be even more robust in the future, not just for looking backwards, but looking at the the present. Right. What if, um, if in theory, China were to launch an EMP over New York? What is that? How many people die? Uh, something horrible, which is, by the way, a very grim uh, oh, yeah. reality for you and I to be living in, if that's the case, where <laughs> we are going to be guinea pigged with horrific scenarios to see what the damage would be in the real world. Um, hopefully, if that is the case, uh, our uh, the programmers in the real world would have enough of a moral framework not to create beings merely to suffer for uh, statistical things. But it raises another question. If if we were living in a simulation, there's no reason we would have to assume that the simulation is being designed by humans. Um, it could be that um, there's an alternate reality where an asteroid didn't wipe out the dinosaurs. And there are super intelligent ankylosauruses walking around in lab coats. And they went, hey, what would have happened if, like, you know those you know those tiny little moles we eat? What if those tiny moles inherited the planet, like in that awesome film, Planet of the Moles? Uh, let's, let's run that scenario, right? Or, or alternately, what if, um, what if it, there's a, a human-adjacent society, like, say, Neanderthals won the war. Uh, and uh, in reality, Neanderthals are, are running around doing, I have no idea what Neanderthals would do. But they went, let's, let's crunch the numbers. If Neanderthals mysteriously died out 200,000 years ago and those homo sapiens that are in all the museums were running the show, what would they have done? And we could be doing that. I mean, 
despite the fact that now all I can think about is dinosaurs running simulations of humans, which is just, I, where is that movie or book? I, I want to read that right now. You know, if, 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 the, if the show Dinosaur, uh, the, the, the puppet show oh, from I like love the early I'm 90s. the baby, gotta love yeah, 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 yeah. If that had kept going, maybe they would have eventually done that. That is, that's probably how it started. Not technically science fiction, but a phenomenal show. Oh, that was like, that was the last time I voluntarily woke up before six in my life. <laughs> like I would wake up, I was in middle school and that was going on and I would wake up at 5.30 to watch that show. I loved it so much. Oh, I, I I loved it as well. Um, and there's there's a, uh, a the, the dying civilization scenario, right? So uh, the dying civilization scenario would be that um, our the human beings are going to be wiped out or are wiped out for whatever purpose. But there's enough of a push to create effectively a time capsule, and this could be for someone else to experience, um, or it could be um, that humanity is destroyed, but we're able to keep it going as a simulation, and that's the only way that humanity goes forward because of horrible climate change or an asteroid is going to hit us, we, whatever the thing is, right? So like a sci-fi example of that would be the very good TNG episode I of The Inner just Light. I was thinking of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah uh, exactly. Uh, for, for people unfamiliar with it, phenomenal TNG episode. Uh, uh, Captain Picard uh, and the rest of the crew encounter a dead civilization and they, they like scan it and it just shoots a beam into Picard who experiences... I think like 70 years or something, like or like maybe not that long, like 50 a years. Full, a full life. A full life, like a, a great-grandfather level life. Um, and, uh, and, and it's all for him. It's just like it's this last gasp of the civilization when it's done. To preserve its, its history mm-hmm. and, and knowledge of, of, this, of what happened to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it, it, was, it was brilliant. And in fact, there is another example um, from uh, entertainment of something like that, but for completely other reasons, like just for sheer entertainment in Rick and Morty. I don't right. know if you watched that show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that's the episode, um, the M. Night Shyamalan or something <laughs> like that, yeah. You have a, I love Rick and Morty, yeah. You have an uncanny ability to remember episode names. That is just amazing. But Thank you. I, I in no way sat down drinking coffee an hour before you and I met, <laughs> writing out all the episodes I could think of to sound smarter. Sure, of course not. Um, and, and that is awesome because he's unsuspectingly, again, just like Picard, puts on this, this headset and starts what he thinks playing a game and goes through an entire lifetime. And he only reached, you know, oh, right. uh, yeah, achieved yeah, yeah. such and such. And, uh, what, 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 and the, Rick makes fun of him for, you know, you know, doing a what, boring what, life even in, in uh, VR. Well, they've got two then. Yeah, you reminded me because that's, I can't remember the episode. I think that's early on. There, there's an episode where, yeah, there, there's literally a video game where you experience an entire life. And like Rick goes into it and immediately like burns a social security card and goes off the grid because <laughs> Rick, Rick is a nihilist, right? Whereas Morty like becomes a grandfather. But there's another episode where where um, there are aliens trying to trick Rick into yes. giving um, his his combination or his his formula for warp speed or something like that, right? And so they've, uh, un- unbeknownst to him, although he clearly suspects it early on, they have brought him into the simulated universe and are trying to coax the data out of him at yeah. any given time. Yeah. Um, and there's a Deep Space Nine episode uh, with Miles O'Brien. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a big DS9 fan. I love Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Um, the writers incidentally enjoyed putting Miles O'Brien through terrible stuff because O'Brien was such a likable everyman character. They knew that they would get a lot of emotional pull out of subjecting him to horror. Uh, and there's a great episode where he he's on some alien planet and he effectively commits inadvertent manslaughter, something like that. So he didn't knowingly murder anybody, but he did kill somebody. And their court system um, orders him to, to be imprisoned for like 50 years. And he doesn't know this, but he is sent to a prison planet with a, a, a buddy who's in his cell with him, and he doesn't leave until he finally flips out and kills the guy. Uh, and and then the rest of the episode, you see him kind of wandering around Deep Space Nine because he's experienced like 50 years in the blink of an eye in this uh, simulation scenario. Yeah, and and um, the the Star Trek has a, a few great examples with the holodeck, yeah. right? Not only about potential future ability to simulate a complete environment where once again, they play off of the um, faking out whether you came out of the simulation or not, just like um, the episode with, with uh, Moriarty in... Uh, yeah, in, in, uh, which is one of the best the ones. Moriarty is one of the best characters. I, I, like, I like Moriarty in Star Trek more, more than, than I like <laughs> Moriarty in Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, exactly. And then there are other examples like in... Uh, 
one of the only two Black Mirror episodes that I was willing to watch. The, right. The, the only two ones that don't make you want to kill yourself. Right. Um, the one with some uh, simulated realities, Hang the DJ, spoilers, mm-hmm. um, it, where, where they basically, this is a dating app. Yeah. And they wanted to run people through simulations of, of interacting with people until they find the right one because they end up escaping the simulation together, right? Right. They, they break apart just to be together. Yeah, they, they basically in that episode, and I, I, like, I've come around on Black Mirror, by the way. I was very much against Black Mirror when it first came out. First, but they began the episode oh. with the prime minister having sex with a pig. And like, I felt like the first season, every episode of Black Mirror ended with the director looking into the camera going, don't you feel like a piece of shit? And I'd be like, why are you making me feel bad? I don't want to watch Prime Minister have sex with a pig. I'm a nice guy. I wouldn't do that. And I, I've, I've come around to where I think it's it's very good non-comedic satire. But uh, I was initially like strongly opposed to it because of how hellishly pessimistic it was. Oh, yeah. But that is one of the one of the fun episodes, or one of the lighthearted Uplifting, episodes, right? There's perhaps. like that and San Juniper is the other San one. San Juniper, yeah. San uh, which is kind of like, they're all aware of it, but it's a virtual reality. It's still, yeah, still virtual reality. Yeah, yeah but yeah, but the, the um, uh, Hang the DJ, um, yeah, the, the interesting conceit on that one is that um, it's it's running the simulated reality like I think a hundred times or something with just various people that have been beamed into this world unknowingly, um, or at least uh, they sort of have te- temporary amnesia or something, and it's just running it to see who they would best um, be compatible with. Right. Uh, and if if we were to pr- uh, jump from that to our own reality, then then in that scenario. We're living in a simulation which is utilitarian in mindset. It is designed to determine the optimal experience or outcome for whoever the scenario is being designed around. Yeah, so that could be on a macro level public policy, um, although presumably they would have ironed out a lot of the stuff by the time they get to that, where they're not really debating whether or not you know they're going to pay for vaccines or whatever the thing is, right? Um, or it could be, um, yeah, like they uh, you're when you hit 16 in the future, they're like, we're going to run... Three, four thousand scenarios with you in it to figure out what your job would be that right. you would most like, uh, and it, like you know, so you your experience. There's like basically an artificial multiverse being created for you, where you're a fireman in one, and then in the other one you're a doctor, and one you're the president or whatever, and then at the end it's like you know what? It turns out you're most happy as a plumber. That's what you should do. You're most happy as a plumber, and you should marry Janet, uh, and uh, it, it, you go from there. Yeah. I mean, uh, San Junipero is actually a great additional example because that is creating a sort of afterlife. That you can choose to opt into. Granted, they kind of know they're in that scenarios, but it is an, an all or nothing. Like once you decide that that's that's where you're at, um, that is like a functional way to create virtual environments or a, a complete simulation that you end up basically living in. Right. Right. Which um, which I'll, I'll make a, a break because I do feel like there's a, a distinction between like the simulation where we don't know it, where we don't have confirmation. Right. Versus like the VR realm, right? So like uh, Permutation City, which I might talk about in a future podcast, is predicated on that, where the people in it know that they're in it. Yeah. Um, at the end of the Matrix, it, the the film conclu- or the the trilogy concludes with um, avoiding the. Uh, I, I think I think that the conceit of the Matrix is that um, people basically flip out if the universe is nice. They have to have problems that they're overcoming. Otherwise, they go insane, uh, which is why the, the, the our robot overlords never make heaven for us. They always give us the crappy 1990s <laughs> yeah, to relive over and over again. And at the very end, what they basically come up with is, well, we'll give people the option. They can either live in the real world, which kind of sucks and is rusty, and live in the center of the earth, or you can live in this you know uh, thing. Um, and so there, there, are, there are science fiction scenarios and, uh, and future scenarios in which we plug into an artificial universe that we're aware of. Why, oh, why didn't I take the blue pill? <laughs> <laughs> but there's there's actually an example that I love in illustrating one of the problems in the simulation hypothesis. Okay. Right? So uh, a lesser known movie called The 13th Floor. Right. Which I think, I don't I can't remember if it preceded um, The Matrix or not. We can look that up. But I think it I think it preceded it. And I feel like 9-11 overshadowed it. So, oh, something overshadowed yeah, it. Because I, I only saw that recently. Uh, but And I'll, I'll ask you to explain it here in a minute. I saw, or, I saw it about five years ago, but much later than I saw The Matrix. It's a phenomenal film. It's great. And I, I didn't even know about it until I was in my late 20s. But yeah. I, I think, yeah, either it came out like on the day 9-11 happened it or The Matrix the radar. Beat it by a week or something. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and what was cool about it is that, and again, spoilers, um, skip this part or come back later if you... Haven't watched it. Um, there is a, a, if I remember it correctly, a company that works on, you know, a, a virtual reality, and he can, you know, the person can go in it, but the, the NPCs do, don't really know, you know, they're in a, a virtual environment, only to discover at some point, 
you know, that just like the characters actually are discovering slowly that they are in a virtual environment, the person who created this simulation eventually discovers that he himself is in a nested virtual simulation and is really not a real, quote unquote, real person in the real mm -hmm. world, which gets into the problem of infinitely nested simulations. Right. As soon as you posit that this world can create simulations that are indistinguishable from reality, you know, why not that simulation creating a simulation within it that creates another, right. you know, virtual reality and it's, you know, simulations all the way down. Mm -hmm. There is like a computational problem in there or some kind of a logic issue that would say like, okay, that might not actually be feasible. Maybe not, but I like that's one of the, so one of the, um, the major criticisms that I've read about um, simulation theory is the idea that there, there is not the computational processing necessary. The, the, the size of a computer necessary to run a universe-wide simulation would have to be the size of the universe. Now, we already Correct. talked about that somewhat in terms of rendering and the idea that you wouldn't actually have to map it all out constantly. You'd only have to map it out as far as conscious beings are interacting with it. Um, but I also think a, another way of, of getting around that is we're presuming that the real universe is the same laws of physics as our universe. And that is a, a, a leap of, of faith, right? So like to, to bring in faith, C.S. Lewis in one of his books talks about, um, I can't remember what it is, but basically he says, we think we live in a vast universe, but it's like compared to what? Like, like what, are you, what are you basing that inference off of? <laughs> yeah. It might be a very tiny universe. It might be a very large universe. We don't really know because we have no standard by which we can judge it outside of us. So I actually love the Men in Black, uh, you know, the ending of Men in Black where that, you know, in the, in the in the movie, uh, they're finding the a universe in a cat, right in the in the little pebble yeah, yeah, in yeah. The, in the cat's thing. But then at the end of the movie, you realize it kind of zooms out from the planet into the galaxy and into the rest of the universe, only to find out that we are also this little marble that yeah. a giant you know alien is playing with. Well, and, and I'm thinking that there too that there could be like a degree of complexity where it seems to me we live in an incredibly complex universe, and, sure. and for, for me to develop. Uh, a, a simulation that would be an approximation of our universe would be incredibly complex and necessary to do. But what if reality is way more complex than the simulation we're living in and we're living in like the Mario Brothers Mario Brothers 2 pixelated version of reality that's <laughs> incredibly dumbed down than, than the real world in which place our, our, in which our simulation is taking place in? Yeah, I, I both love this idea and I find it problematic for the following reason. Because one, you can say, yes, we don't actually know if this is any kind of creation within some other reality, within some other universe. We don't really know how it functions, how it looks, what are the parameters, right? Just like we're creating a simulation here with like weird laws of physics and people can float or, mm -hmm. you know, different games have different mechanics and so on. And nothing about the internals of that game uh, is can be informed necessarily within the parameters of the game about the reality that has created it, our so-called reality. And so if you think there is one reality up, anything is right. possible, yeah. right? So that's kind of cool because you can think, well, you know, it is very, it is possible, right? We don't know how come anything, right? We don't know why existence exists. It's one of my favorite questions, like what, what in the hell? But, um, and so one of the possibilities is that, that, you know, the reality above us is just, incomprehensible to us. It, laws of physics is not even like a sensible right. question or something like that. We can't even... Hydrogen doesn't exist or the whole periodic elements are different or the or interactions dimensions between them are different. Or right? like, yes, but energy, like maybe the concepts that don't even fit at all to the framework. Um, but the problem with that is then you can propose anything. It's kind right. of like the God, you know, yeah. answer, you know, why? Because... The gap God, theory, right? theory, why there's a gap so I can fill in whatever I want. And, and the whole thing about the simulation hypothesis is that it is based on what we know about this world. Okay. And if we are basing all the calculations and probabilities of the simulation hypothesis on the facts of this reality, and then, but then we toss all of those facts, if we want to imagine any scenario in the up reality, we should toss the fact that we imagine an up reality. Not that it's impossible, but then I think it throws a monkey wrench in the rest of the theory. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So basically, like, if, if I'm going to go with the level up above our reality, I'm coming from basically a, a, a metaphysical thought experiment as opposed right. to simulation theory, which is beginning with an extrapolation of our current technology and going from there. Right. It's kind of you have to go down into the first simulation to go back upwards and think about the simulation mm -hmm. above. And again, granted, it's, it doesn't tell us whether that's the case or not. But that connects back to the idea of consciousness, that if we are basing the idea of the simulation, that we could in the future simulate not only 
a reality that is indistinguishable from this one, but also simulate conscious beings, then I think we're hinging the whole idea on something that we don't yet understand. Right. Because I do believe that the um, how come anything is conscious is currently an undis- you know a mystery that we don't fully understand. There is a gap of understanding. And while it's not inconceivable to, to think that we could one day create conscious machines, we have no idea where to even start with that or why would some composition of a computer would make a conscious computer and another would not, right? I, I, most people don't believe that our current computers are conscious and I don't think most people believe... I hope not because be- it has access to my Google history. I sure don't want it to be <laughs> conscious. <Yeah. laughs> think of what happens when it starts uh, oh, talking God. and yeah. uh, I have a record of you. Yeah. Um, And so that is kind of a that is kind of a problem as far as I'm concerned, because then at the very least, you would have to go to matrix route and propose that if this is a simulation, there are billions of conscious units, right? Brains, uh, people in in pods like in the matrix uh, connected to the simulation. And then the fact that was used to calculate the probability that we can just like generate infinite amount of, of simulations doesn't actually increase the probability that we're in the simulation because there's only one of each of us plugged into one simulation. Uh, and so, you know, you can now suppose many things about the, simula- the, the, the universe one up from here, but if you are basing it on the fact that all we know about consciousness is that you need a physical brain uh, to facilitate it or, or, or generate it or whatnot, um, then generating you know easy simulations by the thousands doesn't actually increase your chances that this one is a simulation. Okay, all right, interesting. Does that make sense? I think I follow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've still I've still had sufficient caffeine to follow what you're saying. <laughs> I'm on the edge of my my ability. All right. Um, but before I lose track of it, I want to bring up another uh, another scenario you alluded to at the beginning of the program, which is the amusement scenario. So in this scenario, we are living in a simulation for the gratification of someone outside of the simulation. Uh, and probably the most recent um, example of that in sci-fi that I can think of um, would, I guess, be Westworld. Now, in Westworld, it's a hardware simulation, right? right? Um, no one's plugging into a computer, or at least so far they haven't in the series. But um, there is nonetheless a, an, artif- an artifice that's been created for the amusement of other people. Um, and I got to say, uh, that makes a lot of sense to me in that, um, you know what sounds like a really boring video game? Planet where everybody gets along super well. You know what sounds like a pretty fun video game? World War Two. World War Two seems like a more fun video game for like a like a seventh grader in, in some alternate reality. The success of Call of Duty and the rest of the yeah. you know uh, first person shooters. It's why that's why it's called first person shooter. Uh, is because people find it a lot of fun. Now, I would argue that there is moral implications once you get to a level of realisticness. Um, you know, beyond the uncanny valley, perhaps, or beyond some point, let alone if you're actually building this into robots in the real world, I would propose that there is now an effect, you know, granted, if these um, robots perhaps are not conscious, then you can't say that it's a moral problem to, you know, shoot them or, or abuse them in some way. But I do think that there would be an impact on us. Yeah, well, I got to say, if like if we're living in a simulation, this just entirely for some cocky 16 year old to be able to drive a tank in world war ii and then he like left it on and we're, we're not even like it's this isn't even a part of it he's just he left it on and he went on christmas vacation or something and like now we've got a game show host president like all this weird stuff right um that would be horrible that would be a, a like a, a a truly horrific world scenario in which beings are being created to suffer for the entertainment of someone else right and and again spoilers for westworld it is implied that they are becoming, either are or are becoming self-aware and actually conscious, meaning they can suffer, is where that becomes problematic because now, while it was for our entertainment, now we are affecting, you know, the experience of conscious creatures, basically. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the the simulation, you know, us as a simulation of some, you know, some programmer or somebody who just bought a, like, simulator world, uh, you know, device. Oh man, let's check this out. Where the Allies win World War Two? <laughs> yeah, I love that. There's a new show called For All Mankind, where the premise is: What if uh, you know the Russians actually made it to the moon first, and that propels a whole different space race? Cool, right? So these kinds of simulations, like what will happen if X or Y? 
then somebody leaves it on, or maybe it just yeah, runs through it and outputs the, 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 the end result, and we're actually experiencing sort of it in, in real time. If it's running in real time, you worry about, or maybe pray for somebody tripping on the wire, right? And unplugging we're, the simulation. We're, yeah, we're, we're pray against, right? Because like, right. What, what if what if the whole point of this is like, what if Chester A. Arthur won the like? You know, they just go through every single. There's there's uh, you know, it, it, it it's so easy to to compute these things that any presidential election, there's a scenario in which all the candidates, like there's one where where Jill Stein becomes president, right? There's there's one where Gary Johnson's president, right? And if, and if that's the case. And the point of it was to figure out what if Thomas Jefferson won the election. Um, I wouldn't want them to just shut our compu- the computer off uh, and have everybody just quit existing. I'd want them to keep running it. But then at that point, it's just kind of off to the races and doing its own thing. Yeah, maybe, I don't know about a reboot, but maybe some uh, software update, I mean, maybe you, a little what, tweaking what, of what, the parameters. What, what would be nice in this scenario, if I were designing it, is I would have everything just pause except the people, and then like the sky would turn bright white, and you'd hear a guy go, hey, good job, everybody. Listen, here's what's been going on. We really wanted to see what would happen if Grover A. Cleveland came back and won a second election. Crazy scenario. Anyway, uh, we, we've designed this really nice world for you and we're going to funnel everybody through there. Don't worry. Like, you know, everybody's taking like that kind of thing. Um, you know, maybe. Um, which brings me to, um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to call this Heaton's simulated reality hypothesis. This is something that I've, I've been uh, gnawing on for a few weeks. What if we're living in a simulation and the point of the simulation is to determine what happens when, um, all religious experiences are real and valid. They're all happening. So what I mean by this is Muhammad really did fly a horse to the moon or whatever. I, I, and I'm not trying to be flippant. I just don't remember what the, the, the mythology is. I, you know, Whatever the, the Hajj is the, where he goes to Mecca. That really happened. Joseph Smith really did have the, the prophet Moroni, uh, Moroni come down. Uh, you know, L. Ron Hubbard, totally legitimate. L. Ron Hubbard <laughs> actually had all of these things come in. And so any, anybody that you're talking to that's had a, a religious experience, that was programmed into them, right? So either either there's some percentage of the population that will have a religious experience and it'll manifest in whatever their religious background is, or there's just random ass scenarios that happen where, where the programmers go, here's, okay, all right, we're we're gonna tap that guy, and he's gonna have you know aliens come. Like, we're you know what? Just one out of every eight farmers in Iowa gets abducted. Let's just see what happens, and it's just to see what occurs when when truly mutually exclusive realities are interacting all the time. And it would explain a lot in terms of like why some of your friends are convinced they've seen ghosts, and some of your friends think it's absolute balderdash. Both of them are actually completely valid because the reality that they've been experiencing has been accurate. Yeah, that's a that's actually a fascinating. Uh, proposition because people actually use the phenomena of like you know paranormal activities or things that are unexplained the quote unquote glitch in the matrix right they use that as a indication like deja vu right. being a sign that the simulation is you know was hiccuping or was changed on purpose and I do wonder many times right like if we're actually experiencing what we're experiencing it's different but we use almost exclusively the same language up to a point about talking about our experience but it 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 takes the idea of like maybe we each are experiencing something pretty different to vastly different uh to an extreme yeah and uh if it was programmed that would explain a lot yeah we're all we're all experiencing different realities but we're still able to interact with each other and it would it would account for a lot of the discrepancies between said realities it's like in those games where you can each character selects like the the little uh, toggles of they have more charisma, less uh-huh. uh, you know energy. But this is actually about perception type, right? Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, I'm, a, I'm more high in this religion, and then less uh, seeing uh, you know paranormal. Sam, activity. Sam Harris gets zero, but but meanwhile, like Billy Graham gets an eighty. And so they're they're getting these completely different scenarios running all the time. That would explain a lot of difficult conversations where people just don't get on the same page yeah. about what they're what they're experiencing. Uh, Ubik is worth bringing up. Have you have you read much Philip K. Dick? Uh, no, but I've watched the recent. Uh, yeah, well, we we just lovely, watched uh, uh, yeah uh, 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 predestination. No, that's Heinlein. But oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 I'm, sorry, I'm yeah, talking yeah. about uh, Electric Dreams on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Uh, so they took a bunch of his little stories and oh, made. Oh, cool! It's 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 actually like a Black Mirror without the depression. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say that it's like Black Mirror. I haven't seen it yet, but I'd say Philip K. Dick would be Black Mirror minus depression plus acid. Uh, Philip, oh, yeah, that sounds like, about right. I don't like reading Philip K. Dick back to back because it makes me question reality too hard. There you go. Uh, and he loves doing that. And like Ubik is a good example where a uh, f- phenomenal book. Um, Ubik is predicated on the idea that um, there is a kind of half-life that is 
uh, accessible to people after death. So it's kind of, imagine like Tibetan Buddhism plus computers, something like that, right? So if you get, if you get um, killed in a car wreck, you're dead, but your brain is accessible for a while and they can plug you into a computer and, and you can interface um, for some amount of time, like 10 years or something like that, and then eventually you're gone, right? So a lot of people are kept in this quasi-state where like the main character, his, um, his wife dies but he's able to like activate her and talk to her and they they're both aware of this and and uh and um they know that they've got like f four years worth of, of time to talk before she's gone in terms of being activated um spoiling the book for people uh there's there's an explosion that happens and um the the crew in this detective agency notice that like weird things are happening like they're looking at their quarter and like it has a picture of their boss on it, and they're like, "Why the hell is this on it?" And they eventually realize that they have all been killed in this explosion, and are now living in this simulated universe. <laughs> and their boss is desperately trying to reach them by giving them these little clues and things, but they're they're trapped in it. Um, another great simulation one uh, is Total Recall. Yeah. Also, also Philip oh, yeah. K. Dick. Huh. Um, yeah. yeah. And and then I, I've not read his story, but in the film. Rather than going on vacation, you can pay someone to, to create a vacation for you and download the memories. Yeah. So you just go to the vacation store and you go, I, I want to spend a month on a cruise and I want to have a really fun sexual romp and I want to go fishing. And yeah. they go, no problem. And you pay them 100 bucks, download it into your brain, you leave. It's the same for you. Right. Uh, and, and you didn't have to pack. Uh, and But in the book, um, or I should say in the film, um, there's a question of whether or not he is actually in the simulation or not. Uh, and right. uh, and they're on Mars, um, somebody comes and is like, hey, like I'm, I'm here to help you. You're in a simulation. You need to leave with me right now or you're going to be stuck and we never get you out and that kind of thing. And he sees the sweat on his brow to realize that he's not actually part of that is At least that yeah. for him, that's the cue that this is actually happening. And because he, he almost gets convinced, right? That you can, yeah. you can, especially because he went to that vacation thing, you can now easily convince a person, no, you are, this is still, you're stuck in the simulation, which is uh, why I love to bring it again back to, to film and, and sci-fi. Vanilla Sky is I've a great- I've not seen that. Oh, you've not seen no. that? Oh, I highly recommend it. So I'm actually not gonna- Don't spoil it for no, me. I'm yeah. not gonna spoil it, but this is, put, put this one on your list as okay. well because of this, this uh, idea of like, Messing with you know perception of reality and simulations and such. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So that, okay, I'll I'll add that. I should have I should have prepped with that one. Well, so, so then uh, as as we we'll we'll kind of we'll segue out of the scenarios here, but feel free to bring them up if, if at any point you think that it's uh, it's relevant to a situation. Um, how could you go about proving that we live in a simulation, uh, or could you? Is that possible for us to do? I think that's one of the biggest problems. Uh, is that for the most part, at least for now, it seems to be an unfalsifiable, unfalsi right. um, if I can say it, maybe we can prove it, but yeah. unfalsifiable uh, hypothesis. And so, that, but that doesn't mean that in the future it, it will be. And there could be all sorts of scenarios that would give us indication. Maybe there are, you know, if this is a simulation and it doesn't simulate everything fully, right? If there are computational tricks in order to render things more easily and so on, we might be able to push the simulation in such a way that will reveal the little nooks and crannies and, and little issues or, or glitches in the code, so to speak. And there are scientists who are trying to look at changes in like tiny, tiny changes in the laws of physics over time. And it might be over a large span of time that we can't actually do this because if you're, if, um, if a computer program is, is running constantly, right, there is like error correction and like issues that sort of pile up that can gunk up the, you know, the processing speed or something like that, right? It's using too much memory or, or whatnot. And over time, something doesn't stay, like the clock timer of some process doesn't actually stay consistent mm. and you'll start seeing issues like that. So the first place, you know, scientists look at least, that's you guys um, noticed the laws of physics. Pluto disappeared for about a month and then it just popped back in. That's odd. Yeah. 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 Where did it go? Yeah. Or, or like, like I think that they, they did account for this, but there was a thing about the time that I, um, that I, uh, to, to back up a lot. So Matrix, first mind-blowing concept for me that we might be living in a simulation. Second uh, part of that, which is more direct to the conversation we're having is um, I, I read a scenario years ago where... Uh, and I don't think that this is quite accurate, but but for our purposes, if quantum computing were to be invented, quantum computing would have such incredible um, processing power that uh, it would be able to uh, develop these various simulated worlds and any amount of them. And, and at that point, if you see the headline, scientists have invented quantum computer, you could reasonably infer that they will eventually be able to make 
uh, a simulated universe, and they can make countless of them. Therefore, the next logical step is the probability that you're living in the real one is very minimal. Now, I, I think I'm being too reductive with quantum computers there, and I'm giving quantum computers too much power. Uh, but, but that was kind of the... Um, the big step. So uh, I had read that, and then like a week later, I saw a headline that like scientists uh, can't account for like they're like basically looking at the Big Bang. They're like there should be X amount of copper, and there's not. There's Y amount of copper, uh, and like like things <laughs> like that. And it's like probably there's something that we just don't know about yet. But also, it's like well, okay, if if we were living in a simulated universe, you would see little errors like that creep in where there there there's too much titanium or something like that. Right. Or how we're uh, trying to account for. The motions of, of stars in the galaxies and the amount of stuff that we seem to see in terms of weight and gravity and come up with like dark matter mm -hmm. or dark energy and trying to sort of solve this weirdness that we're again we can't account for exactly and for now it's still we had to call it something ambiguous because we just it's it doesn't fit oh, with our, God, with what, our what, model. If, what if dark matter is just like star trek jargon where they like the the, the programmers <laughs> the programmers wanted to have the solar systems look a certain way because it looked cool <laughs> and they but there was no actual physical explanation for it so they're like uh, i'm just gonna hard matter. code it yeah, yeah there's just, just dark like, matter yeah. the, the humans can figure out whatever they think uh whatever Let's they, leave a comment we'll fix it later just don't worry about th it there's um have you heard of a guy named tom campbell um, he's he's uh, definitely like metaphysics type guy, uh, more more than hard, from my vantage point, hard science type guy. If there are any Tom Campbell fans listening to the show, feel free to uh, to, to ping me on that. Um, Tom Campbell is, uh, he gained notoriety um, through the Monroe Institute. So Tom Campbell was a NASA scientist for a while and then went to the Monroe Institute, which is very much like trying to think through reality and like induce trance states and that kind of thing. So a little bit more touchy-feely, uh, but he comes from a physics background. And he paired up with a guy from Caltech and a guy from, uh, I think, JPL. Um, and they went on Kickstarter like last year and raised about $250,000 to try and come up with um, an experiment to determine whether or not we're living in a simulation. And I could not penetrate the paper. It was so, so, de I could, I assume that they're being honest and not making up terminology, but I tried reading the, the paragraph. I, I basically it boiled down to they're going to do a series of experiments on, um, uh, on kind of what, what is the, the quantum, um, Oh, that thing where they shine a flashlight at something and the, the beam splits and goes through. You, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. The sort of thing. They're, they're going to be analyzing that on a hyper level a series of times to try and figure out if it adds up or not. And, and from there, determine whether or not we're living in a simulation. Yeah, there are two things that, that people look at and think like, okay, there's, some, there's something funky here. One is a little bizarre, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But the fact that there are sort of particular parameters in the laws of physics and in the universe that half, you know, in order for anything to even look the way it does and function the way it does, it has to be that, like, you know, Planck scale or some, some, or the, the speed of light, right? Why are those parameters, you know, quote unquote, seem to be fine tuned exactly such that everything seems to come together? And, you know, that is a question we don't really know how to answer or, or even how to ask exactly in terms of why those specific parameters and where did that come from and, and so on. The other thing is that there is a there's a um, a scientist um, from I think he's from MIT I forget his name but he is you know you know highly awarded and he was on Obama's science council and he claims to have found somewhere in string theory in physics computer code in the laws of physics like some particular uh, algorithm type computer code. Now, I am a little bit skeptical about the use of the words computer code here. I think there's just sort of patterns that we can, you know, match and, and maybe say, oh, there, this is like, you know, computer code. But he is, you know, proposing that as a possibility uh, or people have, you know, took that train and, and wrote it to say, uh, this might be an indication that we are, you know, living in a simulation. Here's like actual algorithms in the laws of physics, right? Instead of saying, oh, perhaps we come up with algorithms because there is something natural about the way math is, right, right. which is part of the, you know. So. Is, is, it, is it descriptive or is it us crack, cracking the code? Because you, you could come up with like the Fibonacci sequence to right. describe something naturally occurring, right? Right. Um, or, or like to go back to the like, how is it that we have such finely tuned uh, laws of physics? I mean, that's part of the reason uh, for the multiverse theory, right? Because the idea is that it's not that there's something brilliant about our universe. It's that there's any number of, of universes out there. It's just that... Ours can actually support life, which is why it, why we're in it, as opposed to one where light goes at arbitrary speeds or something like that. And nothing can come together. Yeah, I forget the name of this sort of fallacy or or, or or idea, but 
if you think about the fact that there could be multiple universes, right? And this one happened to have the parameters to create conscious life that would then reflect on that fact, it's only because we are con we are here to even think about it that of course we will be here in a universe that is fine-tuned to support life that we can even say, oh, how come this is fine-tuned? Well, only in a fine-tuned universe will we be here to even say, why is it fine-tuned? Right. There, there's actually a very good Douglas Adams quote on that, uh, where who, by the way, has his own simulated universe in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, there's a, a bit where um, uh, Zaphod, Beeble, uh, Zaphod Beeblebrox, oh my gosh. No, Beetlejuice. Oh no! Oh. Am I? I need. I need more caffeine. Uh, I'm, I'm going to blame this on overprocessing power on my part. Zaphod um, goes through. He goes into some like walk-in computer, and the, the guy. And it's like it's very important you leave through the window, by the way. And it's because they want him to continue in the simulated universe. And the book takes place in it for a while, and then he comes out of it. But Douglas Adams had a quote, and I think the Salmon of Doubt, where he's talking about. Um, one of the, uh, and I'm not, I'm not looking to stir up uh, religious arguments for this next statement. This is really to indicate the, the multiverse theory that we're talking about. Um, one of the arguments against um, sort of natural materialistic evolution is, well, we seem so finely tuned to this universe would not, not belie a, an architect of it. Uh, and uh, Douglas Adams would say that's kind of like if a puddle could talk, it would go, well, look how tightly I conform to the world I live in. It's complete fit. Uh, doesn't that indicate that I was designed to live in this space? I, the puddle, am the exact dimensions of this basin that I live in. And it's like, well, no, it's because you, you're filling it that that's the reason that that, that, uh, that, that has occurred. Yeah, there's nothing quite like uh, Douglas Adams' observations about life and everything else. But people have actually said, you know, the simulation hypothesis is just a sort of new type of religion or deity yeah. kind of uh, uh, format to say, oh, now it's just the programmer in the sky, right? The, 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 right. the, the, the creator of this world is just some either advanced civilization or some alien which, civilization. Which I think is like, like and I, I could very easily be wrong in this, but I believe that there's like a, a, a concept in Buddhism quite like that, or not Buddhism, in, in, uh, in Hinduism quite like that, where um, kind of everything is a manifestation of Brahma. Um, so the, 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 the whole universe is ultimately kind of a dream state of the, the primordial being. And yeah. we're, we're living in this manifestation of that. But the, the actual underlying reality is, is Brahma itself and not us. Yeah, and the, uh, they're, they're, the scientific variation of this is, I think, formulated something like the holographic universe, mm -hmm. right? Where And again, digging further and further down into physics, we realize that, quote unquote, physical reality seems very non-physical right it's just sort of energy or 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 waves of fields right uh, interacting with each other and not just manifest as material or something like that but it's very ephemeral in some sense see and that's where um i i, I kind of cock an eyebrow on on simulated universe theory as a comedian because i'm not a physicist right i clearly i do not know like there's i'm sure there's somebody listening to this program that's an engineer and a physicist who's just like just taking his eighth drink because he because i'm blundering this so bad my apologies uh future show ombudsman um but like uh so so going back to the the, the kind of um wave versus particle quantum problem right um, my understanding of this is and, and people listening have probably heard this you might understand this i'm still trying to grasp it but as i understand it um there's this problem of why does uh, photons behave differently depending on whether or not they're observed or not so the old theory was that photons were packets of light um, uh, but there's another theory that they're waves, and it turns out that they're kind of both simultaneously, and it depends on whether you're looking at it or not that they act it. So uh, if you want to kind of have a, a, a model to follow along with, imagine that we've got a canvas on a wall in a room, and we've got a uh, one of those tennis ball launchers, and all of the tennis balls have been dipped in blue paint, and it's firing these at the canvas. That's the packet model, where the, the photons are acting like particles. Whereas um, if the canvas were in a room and the room were filled with paint and you dropped a brick in it and the paint washed up and made a line across it that's the wave thing uh and 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 this is where i get lost because i can't further explain this any more beyond this can, can you take it from here yeah yeah i'll try so that is actually a, a great way to illustrate um the results of of the what shows up on the wall right in terms of you know throwing photons at it um but now if you add if you take the one slit if you put a slit in a in a, in a barrier right before between the wall and the shooter mm -hmm. um if you if you fire you know individual tennis balls it will create like one line from top to bottom right. at the end of that wall if you take two slits 
right? Then you will create, uh, if you fire them uh, individually, you create, supposedly you'll create two lines. But if you push a wave, right? If you drop uh, something into, you know, the water, and it will create an interference pattern because from the two slits, there will be two waves going forward and they will interact with each other such that on the wall, there will be like a, uh, a crest in a trough, I forget the, the, the terms. One will be, you know, uh, more intense and others will be lighter uh, depending on the interference pattern, whether it, they combine to create a higher wave or they uh, cancel each other out to create a, a lower point. The interesting and bizarre kind of thing is that even when you fire individual photons through the two slits um, and don't observe either of the slits, so to, if, if you're firing one at a time and you don't know which one it passed through, right? That is the idea. If you don't measure that, if you don't interact with that in such a way, as they add up, it will create an interference pattern of waves, not of individual particles, despite firing individual particles through it which is the conundrum. How come you're firing individual ones, but it, they seem like they're interfering with themselves in some you know, wave interference pattern? And that's where the, the, the oddity. And where I, as a comedian, go, I know when somebody's fucking with me, and that sure sounds like it. Like, I look at that and I'm like, sounds to me like if we, if we dig too far down in reality, um, the, the, the programmer put in a little mystification that is amusing to them uh, that keeps us from drilling down into the, the base level reality itself. Yeah, I've tried to dig into this and listen to books and lectures and everything, trying to wrap my head around not just the fact that that, that is what is being claimed, but why do physicists believe uh, what they what they say they believe, right? Like, why do they talk about it in terms that just doesn't seem to make sense? Supposedly because the data seems to support it. Now I, you know, have my own theories, but I'm not actually informed enough to to you're, propose you're, them. You're not a comedian like me who can weigh in on this yeah, with yeah, absolute certitude. Yeah, but I, again, I t to me the best sort of conceptual abstraction that I was able to create is that yes, it's all waves, right? But there, if you think about like a peak, a small peak of a wave. Um, and that creates like a single point while the whole thing is uh, spread out across a whole area that, you know, um, sort of accumulation of a, a, a tall wave to one point. If you think about that layer, that height is like the layer that we can see and interact with, that would look like a single item, like a single point or, or a particle. And I think that when, um, you know, these waves of, of, of fields uh, interact, they create like basically those those particles that can then more easily interact with each other and and so on. So one away from one field uh, can interact with a wave from a different field. Okay, so then it doesn't sound like that conundrum is hard evidence that we're living in a simulation, but rather just an interesting phenomenon to observe and think about. Yeah, I, I don't I don't see necessarily how it's uh, it's related, but it, it it adds to the weirdness. Yeah, it adds to the weirdness. Well, uh, like I'll add this, and I'm stepping so far out of the realm of like <laughs> anything we could measure right now. I, I apologize for even going this far afield, but it, I, I'm going to bring it up. Do you have any friends that have tried DMT? Or have you tried DMT? I have not tried DMT. I know a few people yeah. who have tried DMT. I, I have not tried DMT either. However, I also know a few people, and it's fascinating to talk to them about it. Like one of my friends did it recently, who is far more cynical and materialist in his worldview than I am. And we were like, this is not someone that I would, I would in any way point to and go, that is a spiritual thinker right there. And I talked to him and he's like, listen, there are reality elves. There are, there are these reality robot elves that are running the universe and they're in, like, and he was like dead set on it. And, um, uh, this is, uh, like a, a fascinating, weird thing to get into. But a lot of people that do DMT talk about having kind of puncturing through to another level of reality and they talk about this common experience of seeing some kind of creatures variously described as robots or elves that are running a simulation that we're living in and the DMT has allowed us to kind of break out of our world and get into that next level. Yeah, since you brought that up, I will say two things because I love that topic and it is fascinating and there is nothing quite like changing your experience of, of reality and your perception even momentarily to show you that perception is not what you think it was, right? And that reality could be far, you know, stranger than what we thought until that moment. Now, in terms of that particular experience uh, and many similar experiences, I actually have a theory that I want to plant in some people's minds is that you can change not only your experience, let's say you, you take DMT and you see like, you 
experience other dimensions or other you know creatures and so on i think that there are dials in the brain so quote unquote dials right mm -hmm. um and some of them are like the realism dial so i'll give two examples you can crank it up and feel that it, your current experience is more real than normal quote unquote daily experience and the, only the first time you experience that like in dmt then you would say oh my god i think this reality is more real or people going through a near-death experience which actually the theory is that their brain is releasing dmt mm -hmm. and actually dmt experiences and near-death experiences are described unbelievably similar which is interesting on its own now or, you, or, or maybe people that have regular spiritual experiences have a leaky dmt valve that's that's i that, i completely agree i think that is probably what is happening it's a theory i don't yeah. i don't know and i don't want to discount their experience um but if you can take the uh counter experience and talk about the realism dial being cranked down and that is actually an interesting experience that happens in lucid dreaming because what happens in the moment that you become aware that you're dreaming that realism dial gets cranked down and you say I see this reality and it looks exactly the same, but the metadata I have now in my head tells me without a doubt that, that, is, that this is just an illusion. So that realism dial is just actually cranked down to tell you this is not real, even though it looks and feels and every input you get says this is real, but the, the metadata, that, that thing or maybe that- like when you're watching a movie or something and you're very aware that like you're kind of absorbed in it, but you know it's not real. Like, you're, like right. there's no part of your brain that's wondering if you're watching Star Wars episode two. Exactly. You know you're watching it. Unless you start hallucinating and then you're like, okay, I am not sure anymore. But sometimes you can hallucinate and say, whoa, I, I'm, I shouldn't be seeing this. But sometimes you can hallucinate or, you know, have, you know, in sort of internal experiences like with DMT and other psychedelics. And that dial would just go up and tell you, this is more real. I know about people who have meditated. There are some people that under meditation can get to a period of time, like two weeks, sometimes more, where they can no longer tell the difference between a dream and reality. And, and, and it throws them off and it's weird and usually it goes away. But you're, you know, with meditation, there's not just awesome benefits. There are like downsides because you're tinkering with the way you perceive and you're, 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 you're fine tuning your attention in different ways. And you might actually trigger some kind of system, you know, um, hiccup that wasn't sort of quote unquote the natural I don't know if there is a natural way of things but the brain from, of most of us has the current fine tuning that most people will call this looks like reality and if I'm in a lucid dream that's just a, a dream but if I'm in a regular dream I don't know and I think it's reality and then when I'm doing DMT that actually feels like more real than this reality sometimes so, so, you're, so you're thinking in terms of the diode this is a sensation of whether something's real or not it's not It's not a, it's a like literal a perception of you're, you're not accurately assessing the reality of the situation but the feeling of how real something is right this is and the reason i call it metadata is because it's not obvious in the actual perceptions that we're used to like sight sound taste and uh, touch and, and so on it is like this uh, a signature on top of the thing it's like a texture of the experience that you're having it's knowledge so the example another example i give is like metadata is just something that you seem to know but that knowledge is just more content in some way. It's just not the content that you're used to. In a dream, you look at someone and they look like your uncle, but in the dream, you know it's your best friend, right? And you can't explain why, but you know that's them even though they look like someone else. That's sort of the metadata that comes with some experiences. And I think whether my experience currently looks real or feels real to me is metadata that is part of the experience. In that that signature of like, is this real? Is this fake? Is this more real? Is this less real? is part of the is the is the like additional information just like you have a photo on your phone um and you can look at the photo and not know where it was taken and so on but if you look at the file you can see that it was taken here with this type of camera with this type of lens like there's metadata embedded into the thing there is metadata embedded into almost every experience that tells you one i am having this experience not like someone else there are people with brain issues where they feel like their experiences are somebody else's experiences or the thoughts in their head, you know, schizophrenia. It feels like the thoughts in your head are somebody else's thoughts. So things like that are like the metadata of the experience um, and that can inform the experience itself. And that's my theory, mm -hmm. at the very least, about some of those types of experiences that can fool you right. very well. So Yeah, okay, that makes sense to me, yeah. Um, I would... Uh, On the other hand, it could be, there could be more realities that we don't, you know, actually know and don't usually perceive unless something is kind of changed. And the, pe the reason people also say that, because some psychedelics actually turn off some parts or turn down some parts of the brain 
and supposedly uh, people claim that this is now removing filters that were there before and now you get access to more of reality mm -hmm. it's hard to say but that it's it's I won't, you know, propose against it. Like it's, it's possible that that is the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like I, I see a few different scenarios um, that, that that seem like uh, logical breakdowns of what could be occurring. So, like if we take, like um, I've not done ayahuasca either, but I've heard similar stories with ayahuasca, right? Where people that are on ayahuasca frequently report seeing a serpent goddess. Now, the the um, the the armchair economist in me wants to immediately bring up the fact that we could be cherry picking data. So it could be that if a thousand people do ayahuasca and see the serpent goddess or DMT and see the reality robots, um, or let me rephrase this, if a thousand people do it and only eight people experience this particular thing, if we only report the eight people out of a thousand, it appears that this is a common experience for everybody, but in reality it's not. We've just connected the dots in such a way to make it seem like it's universal. And it gets worse because the next thousand people have heard about the eight yes. people and now yeah. they're more primed to experience right. it. So it's, it's entirely possible there's not even a phenomenon going on, but rather a statistical problem. Um, that's one, one scenario. Another scenario uh, is that there is a reality. Uh, yeah, archetypes that there's there's some kind of yeah there's some kind of subconscious thing right so like with ayahuasca I think it would be possible and interesting that if you give any human being a particular chemical compound it taps some very deep monkey part of our brain that fears snakes like, okay. I, don't, I don't just weirdly enough you give somebody a tablespoon of ayahuasca and they start thinking about snakes could be could Maybe, could, yeah. could be that it's just there's there's some button we're able to massage with that particular chemical pattern um, or there's the possibility that um, you know there is some kind of ultra alternate or ultimate reality that people are able to tap into, which I cannot speak to. It would be very interesting. Uh, yeah. Uh, in fact, there are, you know, in, in many branches of, of, uh, of physics, they propose additional dimensions or multiple universes, um, not often saying that they can interact with this one. But if you would just even take the multiple dimensions within this universe, um, there are no ways that we can currently experience them, but maybe there is some kind of combination of you know, perceptual change that would allow to see something beyond. And I, I love the um, the idea of the, do you know Flat, the flat World? Yeah, uh, flat, yeah, flat yeah, land? yeah, 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 yeah. Right, so... There's a contemporary of C.S. Lewis who I brought up earlier. I can't remember the, the guy that wrote it, but he was in The Inklings, I believe, with, with C.S. Lewis and with Tolkien. Yeah, Polkin. yeah, and so again, the, the most basic way to say it is if there's a two-dimensional world and you put a sphere through it, all that they will see is like you know, a line or that a circle, circle that's, a growing, circle that's and shrinking, growing and yeah. shrinking, right. And so if there are additional dimensions um, in our three-dimensional uh, world or four-dimensional, if you include sort of time, there's no way for us to perceive or easily perceive right. those additional dimensions or layers and who knows how we, complex we do not have a cognizant yeah i had a this is not nearly so um uh, intellectual as as flat flatland uh or or any of the thought experience we were doing but about five years ago i was drinking scotch and watching a documentary on dog cognition and uh and they were going over all of these uh cognitive uh, cognitive stunting problems that dogs have compared to us right so like uh, for example um dogs can understand that a uh, an object has significance. They know that a leash means walk, right? They understand that, but they can't really fathom the connection between you, the leash, and them, which is why they're wrapping around trees all the time. They just don't understand oh, yeah. relational uh, relationships between objects, right? Um, and there's, there's a bunch of different things like that that we could go through. Uh, and I was thinking, if dogs could talk, and you were to go, what's it like having this stunted view of the world? I think they'd go, what are you talking about? I see the world exactly how it is. I, I have a completely accurate understanding of the world, which is how I feel. I feel as if the world that I am uh, maneuvering through is a very accurate interpretation of the universe. But uh, based on all of available physics, there's all of these dimensions that we're not capable of understanding. So I'm not. I'm seeing it. Uh, I'm seeing the universe in a way that is evolutionarily beneficial to me. I'm right. not seeing the universe in any fundamentally real sense. Yeah, I, I think that that makes a lot of sense, and it's hard to tell. Like, why we are in a position where we can't see beyond because we're embedded in the thing. It's like this is this is I don't know if you know the this is water. Um, oh, I forget his name. Um, a guy who wrote uh, Infinite Jest. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. David yeah. Foster Wallace. David Foster Wallace had a, a great talk called "This Is Water." Um, a, a beautiful video was made out of. A, out of that and where he talks about like, like we're so embedded in life in such a way where it's like fish and water when you you know fish goes next to one another and, and says you know how's the water and he goes like what's right, water?" right right yeah right and so we are we could be embedded in life and in the universe or in our sort of layer 
of experience that we can't really see it for what it fully is, like the underlying uh, c uh, components, and we just get the computer quote unquote interface, right? We just get the icons and the the thing because um, you know for I forget what it's called, like fitness um, evolutionary fitness something. Uh, I'm yeah, yeah. That. Um, we we have evolved to actually not see reality accurately, but to see it beneficially. Right. right? Which and, which makes sense. I mean, we like if if you were constantly aware of everything in the room, which which you you can look at everything in the room, but if you were constantly aware of it, it would overwhelm you. So like we 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 are built to narrow down reality to some extent, and and that's just the stuff that we're consciously aware of. There's could be things we're unaware of too. Yeah, uh, Donald Hoffman gives the example of the uh, particular type of beetle in uh, in the Australian outback where they see the uh, female beetle and it's sort of kind of uh, has a bumpy kind of back and uh, um, a particular brownish color with a little bit of a shine and that's how they know how to go uh, you know get on the, the female and yeah. mate and then and then um, we in invented a particular type of beer in Australia apparently that the bottles you would throw them around and they have that particular bumpiness and texture and light and the beetles, the male beetles, just can't tell the difference. And they go and try to hump these bottles, and they almost went extinct. And now, like, they had to make an effort to get rid of all those bottles, to change them. So the beetle, you know, you, you know, if you ask them before these bottles came along, it's like, oh, I, I know how, what a female looks like. I can, you know, this is, this. my survival depends on it, right? And and uh, they go and, and they, they find the females just fine until there's something that just looks just enough for their particular evolutionary perception that they would make that mistake and we go like, oh, this this beetle is dumb. But it's just not tuned to see the reality the way we do. And might be, it's possible that we see a lot more of it or more complex versions or just the ones that fit us in our complexity, but not beyond that. And beyond that could be vastly different. Yeah. Oh, I think I hit every sci-fi reference that I wanted to. We covered a lot of ground. How much? How much have we been An hour and forty minutes. This is officially the longest podcast uh, that we've done so far. Thank you, uh, man, uh, Jay. This was great. My brain is very full. I feel like I had like a like the gray matter version of a Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, and uh, man, fun talking to you. Thanks for coming on. This was fun. I'm glad we've uh, reached your memory buffer limit great, yeah, and yeah. we've you know exhausted as much as we can. This was awesome. Thank you for like having me on. This has sure. been a blast. And and for people that have fallen in love with your mind and voice, where can they find you? Um, they can go to lastturtle.com for the philosophy podcast. This is sort of a, a just getting started, and I'm uh, adding episodes soon, talking to interesting people about panpsychism and the hard problem of consciousness and the simulation hypothesis. If they're interested in lucid dreaming, they can go to luciddreamingpodcast.com and find me there. I'm at jmutzafi, M-U-T-Z-A-F-I, uh, on, on Twitter and the likes. And uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. Thanks, man. Thank you. So regardless of whether or not we're in the Matrix, if you enjoyed this episode, do us a solid and rate and review it on your platform of choice. That helps other nerds get in on the good stuff with us and grow this mothership into something spectacular. Thank you. So most recently, my fellow comedian friend Nick Spurduti and I went to Skull Island uh, to do some, yeah, uh, I think we're both on the same page in this one, Nick. Some, you know, sometimes I like a planet, sometimes you don't, vice versa. I did not care for Skull Island. I didn't care for it uh, as an island or as a comedy venue, either one. Well, I'm not surprised you didn't like it weather-wise. It's very hot. humid. It's yeah, it's, it's very awful. humid, and it's like, a jungle. Yes, and see, that's the other thing too. Is it, it would be, I'm not even a big beach guy. Because, like, it's... What, There's some beaches. They're, they're, and the beach was okay if, if that had been where we stayed. But I'm just... I don't care. Like, I'll, I'll go to a beach if my friends go to a beach. Otherwise, I would never go to a beach. Yeah, see, that's where we kind of differ. Because yeah. I do like a beach. Yeah, I will yeah, go yeah. just lounge on a beach uh -huh. occasionally. But ton of trees. And I got to be honest. And, and sweltering, like, hot trees. Yeah. Oh, right? yeah, no. Yeah, the terrifying. bugs. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. I mean, I hate outdoors as it is. Yeah. So bugs really. Like, you don't mess even like a manicured up. park. Nope. Like, you don't like Central Park. Dislike. Yeah. And, like, you take Central Park, 
Now, increase the humidity by about 90%. More trees, more bugs. Jack it up by 30 degrees and add in bugs the size of your head. Yeah. And that's Skull Island. Most of Skull Island. Frightening. Yeah. It was, no, didn't care for the weather. Didn't didn't care for the, the people that booked us, to be honest with you, because they the email that we got, I, I forwarded it to you. Liars. Yes. See, exactly. Because the email said inauguration. Yeah. Come perform for the inauguration. Now, I logically inferred they wanted me to do jokes about licensing reform. I thought Don Rickles for Ronald Reagan. Right. That's yeah, yeah, my, yeah. There's yeah. a new king yeah. or a warlord or something, and I, we're going to do, we're going to crack some warlord jokes. Yeah. Uh, I've got so many warlord you've jokes. You've got a lot of warlord jokes. Ton. I've got a lot of licensing regime jokes. We know. Yeah. Like the th- you know, I got the joke about the mortician. Yeah, like, you, what happens if you get rid of mortician licenses? Are they going to bring the corpse back to life? <laughs> it does really well. It, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but but kills. that's what I thought it was going to be. And uh, 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 and, and it, it, um, it was not at all the case as to what they were. They were, uh, I mean, they were pretty much just going to sacrifice us. Well, so technically, I think they're just trying to entertain yeah. what became the new king, I guess yeah. it was a king. because there was King Kong. Which apparently... And which, he died in New York, but yeah. I don't even know how that happened. But... What well, was on the Empire State Building. Well, I mean, I know he fell off. I don't know how he got there. I, like, I missed that. Yeah. But yeah. they So they used to, like... The, so the island... If you're unfamiliar with Skull Island, what we learned, which I didn't know going in, I just thought it was a part of Polynesia. Same. Uh, it is, and it might be, I don't know. But Skull Island... Um, it is populated by this tribe, yeah. but also these giant primordial monsters, like dinosaurs and like gorillas the size of a building. Which apparently, they don't really bother you. They don't really bother the people there, but they do kind of run a pretty tight ship. Yeah, so the way that they make it work is the villagers sacrifice people to the monsters, and the monsters then leave them alone. And that's yeah. how that worked. And we were not told that. And no. I feel like that's a very crucial thing. And we actually, I mean, apparently they had gone through a bunch of stuff before they got to comedians. Yeah, well, and I, I should say, like, to their, now, again, I'm not, I don't, I'm not a fan. I'm not, I'm not going back. I do want to give a little bit of credit to Skull Island in that they are trying to be more progressive. They're modernizing. It used to be that they pretty much just sacrificed, like, blonde women they captured, yeah. from what I gathered. They like, were virgins or something. Yeah. And they're, they're now, they're, they're like, okay, well, it doesn't have to be death. It's just that we have to entertain these monsters. So they've been running through entertainment acts. That's basically yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So they're not really killing them off, but they have been kind of just, like, torturing and putting them into... Right. In, in captivity, more or less. Yeah, yeah. Because well, I, like in theory, I guess if a juggler was good enough, the monsters wouldn't kill him. But so far, no juggler's been good enough. No, that's true. Yeah. I saw a lot of bowling pins. Yeah. Oh man. Well, no, because they like what were the you talked to some of the folks uh, that that we we you know were desperately trying to survive in the jungle. There was at least two members of a ska band. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was. Yeah, they've been through the ska band phase. Yeah, there was. There was a guy on stilts. Uh huh. Um, there was a contortionist. Yeah, really or, nice. Yeah. Super nice. The, my favorite person that I met there was Rafio. Yeah. By far. Rafio was cool. Uh, there was, I gather, they had one of those statue acts, you know, those people that are painted silver. Yeah. I say that because there were a lot of silver limbs everywhere. <laughs> so I assumed that that guy had been a statue, and I don't know why they thought a guy dressed as a statue would entertain a giant monster, uh, but they've, they've tried that. So they're running through these various entertainment scenarios to try and placate and the monsters. then they got to comedians. They got to comedians, and Nick and Heaton we are got the booked. first comedians that we're aware of that came in there. Honestly, a little honored Yeah. that we were asked. Right. They must listen to the show. Probably. That's the theory. Okay. But didn't love, you know, similar to the Kaminets, didn't love that we were the ones picked. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, we get there. We're doing our best. I'm doing my stuff. You know, I was really, I was hitting all my jokes a lot of warlord I d- stuff. I did the thing about. Uh, I did. I mention this earlier. My joke about mortician license. Yeah, no, we got. Did that. I do that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I did that, and that uh, apparently not not a lot of licenses on this island. So not a it, it, it kind of went over their issue. head. Yeah. They they didn't. Uh, and I explained it to them how they work in our country and regulatory capture, and it just crickets. Yeah. <laughs> just nothing. Yeah. Uh, well, when you got to explain it that much. <laughs> yeah. It. I can see how it it didn't. Work. It, there's a reason that I limit my political comedy to think tanks and, and political action committees. I don't usually do club work. Uh, I just, but it, it was a logical inference to make, you know. Yeah. Well, the problem really. So we didn't do well enough. They also made us go at the same time, which was strange. Which was not helpful. Yeah. No offense 
Yeah, uh, no, I'd love don't to take it on stage with you, but yeah, it's yeah, yeah. a little tricky when no, you're trying to work out the crowd. Yeah, and like we did, we did an improv routine, which is pretty good. Yeah, but here, okay, so we, we're doing the dueling stand up, and then we do the improv bit. The improv bit was good. The only yeah. thing that I found problematic there was I was like, can we have a suggestion? And someone yells, a monster killing two comedians in order to placate the other monsters and save the island. And I was like, that's very specific. Can we tone that down? Maybe like yell something you'd find in a kitchen? Yeah. And I uh, just said thank you and started. Yeah, you did because you're a professional. Yeah. But, but then like we did that scene and we're like, great. That was a good scene. Mm-hmm, Can mm-hmm. we do another scene? Can someone give us a suggestion? Someone, a dinosaur ripping two comedians apart to placate an island. And I was like, this is very similar to the last one. Maybe like... They had a dinosaur, so I said, thank you. Right. We did it. We did it. We did a bit about Barney. Yeah. Uh, which was, you know, you're allowed to take a lot of licenses when you're... Which you everyone know. loved. Yeah, they did, Let's actually. Be honest. That one was the best bit. And then I realized, I think they were kind of laughing because of how we painted the dinosaur, which then kind of got us... Yeah. Into some well, trouble. And then they also started laughing and pointing. And we were like, oh, they must be laughing. And it was, I think it, I think they were more laughing at us and specifically laughing at us about to die. Yeah. As opposed to laughing with us. Well, they were pointing at what I thought was a mountain. Mm-hmm. But was actually kind of like a, a, a winged brontosaurus. Yeah, the kuthosaur. Yeah. A yeah. wi- that's a great way a winged if you could imagine a brontosaurus with bat wings who is very pissed off yeah I mean is that about does that about sum it up well I mean it's his mood I don't yes. even understand how that thing flies but it does and it's terrifying oh my gosh well the thing is it's 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 kind of scaly as well the only way that I would have really described it was horrific oh yes it was terrifying it was it was it terrifying was the scariest thing I've ever you, seen okay in person. I think that might have been the scariest moment of my life because the Kuthosaurus coming through, first of all, like we can relate to this, right? Dying on stage is always unpleasant. You're fighting 30,000, 30 million years of evolution that's like don't have the tribe dislike you. There's literally a tribe that's not finding us funny. Also, they didn't love that joke. Yeah, well, you uh, went in through. You said about the like comparing us to evolution and stuff. Right? They don't. They didn't find any of that funny. I brought up sapiens, and I was like, "Did you? Did no one read this book? It was a breakout book of 2017. Yeah. No one read this. No one. Okay. You tried to hand it out to them, and they didn't. Yeah. They didn't, I, uh, they didn't like coffee. my. I made a Malcolm Gladwell joke. They didn't find that funny. Uh, it was just. It was. It was a shit show. So I'm already like, like, ooh, yeah. like feeling like I'm dying on stage here. And then this kuthosaur comes out of the jungle, and its eyes are red, and, and I'm like, I'm scared. And then I look over, and there's a tick on my arm, easily the size of my hand. And yeah. I'm like, this is just too much fear for me to be yeah. dealing with right now. Yeah, because you were dealing with it. probably death, but if you manage to survive. Most likely some sort of Lyme disease. Oh, God. Can you even imagine what Skull Island Lyme disease is like? I, 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 you're not going to fight him and see your way out of that. No. No, you're, God, that's, no. that's a whole thing. Fortunately, the tick didn't bite me. No. I was able to, you know, pluck it off. So that's that was one good thing about that day. Yeah. Uh, but the brontosaurus did, or I'm sorry, Kuthosaurus, Kuthosaur did, like, kind of tail grab us. And then fly off, yeah. which also very frightening. Well, flying in general yeah. is frightening when you don't expect it. And like there was no restraints. No, and it wasn't like he was gentle. Uh uh-uh. uh. Uh uh-uh. uh. Not a bit. And we so we got on top of the mountain. Yeah. Uh-huh. I guess or in the mountain really. Yeah. And it was hard to tell. There's a lot of trees. Yeah, we were in there, and he st- starts uh, like kind of like brushing some stuff aside very clearly where he's planning on eating us. I uh-huh. think. Yeah. And we were there. It felt like. Two, two, three days, maybe? Yeah, probably two. You know, no, that was a... Um, he'd created like a... Kind of like a cave. Like he dug out a cave. Yeah, yeah. And dropped us in there. We couldn't climb out. No. So we were stuck in there. Uh, a lot more silver limbs down there. It's like, so many. Seems like they fed him a lot of statues. Human statue people. Statue people. And it's like, why would you keep doing this if you know he doesn't like them? Like, if, if the goal is to play... Anyway. Well, you know what, though? Here's what here's what I didn't think about. Maybe... And he's just eating them. their torsos, because all the limbs are still there. But maybe he they had them all perform at the same time. Oh. Like you and me. Maybe they had, like, right. six or seven. Okay. Well, that makes sense. So they were like, okay, we'll get seven human statues, and these monsters will be so impressed at the stillness of... They're able to maintain. Yeah. I think that's also why the ska band didn't do well, because there's only two members. Oh, yeah. I think that was probably the issue. There's only the drummer and the bassist. Right. So you had the rhythm down, I'm sure, (laughs) but everything else at that point is like, you know, there's no, you kind of need the horns 
to kind of experience the scarness. I you wish know? they just emailed us and I could have walked them through several things they could have done before we showed up. I'll say, thank God, Nick. Thank God. Well, let's explain what happened first. Okay, yeah. So we're sitting there. We're in We're in this cave-like thing. Yeah. We're certain we're going to die. Basin? I don't know. Yeah. Either way. And then the head of the Kuthasar just comes straight towards us. And we're like, oh, no, it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And it just falls into the thing next to us. I, it almost hit me. I moved out of the way. And it was just lopped off. And it was Sprankles. It was Sprankles, your Wookiee. Sprankles the Wookiee lopped off the head of the Kuthasar uh-huh. with zero fear. Uh-huh. And they they managed to just completely save us. Yeah, and so so if, if anybody didn't hear last week's episode of the show, um, before we went to Skull Island, Nick and I went to Kashyyyk, which is the Wookiee homeworld. Uh, Nick inadvertently, but heroically, saved the lives of six different Wookiees. And as a result, they all owe him a life debt now, and they live with him in New York, and they travel with in us. In my two-bedroom apartment. Yep, they live, and, and they they absolutely refused to not come on our adventures with us. So they were with us the whole time, uh, except for when we were on stage. We, we were very, yeah. we were very, even then we had to kind of fight them on it. Well, you know what, and, and that was when we got captured, too. Yeah. And um, luckily they didn't come with us, because they might have been captured as well. Right. So, you know. But they, they by God, they, I mean, they... Uh, Came and they did it. They, they saved, came and got us. Yeah, they yeah. did save us. I'll, I'll say this: they saved us, and I thought, well, that's an out. Yes, I, like, I thought so great. too. I thought they saved my life. I, I was actually a little bit worried. Do I have a life debt now? Oh. I, but I'm not a Wookiee, and I, I talked to them about this, so yeah. like I'm good. Yeah, like exactly. you know, if I, in theory, if I were to marry into Wookieism, then you fall or convert. Into yes, it, yeah. exactly. If I were to take a Wookiee as a wife or husband. Or if I were to convert to Wookieism, then but I'm not, so no. I'm fine, and they don't expect it. Yeah. But I thought you were going to be off the hook because they uh, saved your life. They saved my life, yeah. so I thought that's, that's it. not how that works. That's done. No, nope. and no, they just said, uh, they just said, well, yeah, no. Apparently, the the life debt's only off when I die. Either you die, or they expire in attempts to save you. Yeah, that's it. So yeah, so still got these still got these six Wookiees. <laughs> <laughs> Still got these six Wookies, which, uh, but you know what? Again, fun to travel with. Yeah. Well. Anyway. Well, fun to travel with if I'm not tired, and it's yeah. kind of exhausting otherwise. But you know, like like we played I Spy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we played the on the the right of the airport. We played the uh, license tag game where you see how many states you can spot. Yeah. And uh, so that you know they're fun. Twenty six. Yeah. Yeah. So. States. Anyway, uh, favorite thing about Skull Island? I I would say. My favorite thing about it was, God, I hated so much of it. <laughs> I think my favorite. They had good tilapia. Oh, I hate fish too. Oh, really? Oh, no. there's nothing for you then. I didn't eat that. Yeah, at all. the only thing I liked about it was the fish. I, I, I will say the beach wasn't that bad. Yeah. I'll say the beach was my favorite part for that day we got to be on the beach before we had to go perform. I will say yes, but. I have never seen dolphins with fangs before. No. And I did not care for that those was things. Scary. I've yeah. like and like they I didn't go in the water. People God oh, help us. I no. wish I hadn't. They like that was yeah, I won't even that's a whole other story, but suffice it to say dolphins are very intelligent and Can apparently there's yeah. Great surfer. You're really good at that. Thank you. You surprised me. The Wookiees also don't like water, so they didn't go in. Yeah. So we just kinda hung back. Yep. But you were you were doing something. I appreciate that. Yeah. You know, I, I picked it up a few years ago and, uh, you know, when I can, which is weird because I don't like beaches. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I like the tilapia. Um, least favorite thing I would say is the giant monsters. I would say, yeah. I'm going to say the bugs, the giant bugs. Yeah. Because the giant monsters, again, didn't bother us except for one. And you know what? Hard to sneak up on you with a giant monster. Easy to sneak up on you with a giant, giant bug. bug. Yeah. Because yeah. giant bugs are still only the size of, like, dogs. Right. So, you know. Yeah. And they're quiet. Very quiet. Monsters make a lot of noise. I mean, you get a little buzzing, but that's about it. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'd say I would give Zero. it like... Yeah. I'm trying to think, because Vulcan was really hot. Um... Well, they don't. You can you can give them the same rating. Oh, then zero. I don't want to go back. I'm gonna say point one. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say a one, because while I hope I never experience a place I would go to less. I have to reserve that on my scale. But I'm going to say a one. So of all the places that we've been so far, this is the place I least want to return to. And I, I hope it remains the... I hope there's nowhere worse than that. Yeah, no, I agree. This is this is, this is was awful. Yep. All right. See you next week, Nick. See you next week. And that's the show. We did it, you guys. What a thought piece, huh? 
If you're living in a computer simulated video game, you probably just scored a shit ton of points for awesomeness. Thanks, Jay Mustafi, for a thought expanding and coffee quaffing chat. Thanks, Taylor Stanbridge, for cleaning up the audio. And thanks, Nick Spruduti, for joining me once more for Intergalactic Comedic Exploits. We'll see you next week. <laughs>